please call the roll. Curtisy? Here. You daily. Here. Fritz? Here. Wheeler? Here. Under Portland City Code and state law, the City Council is holding this meeting electronically. All members of the Council are attending remotely by video and teleconference, and the City has made several avenues available for the public to listen to the audio broadcast of this meeting. The meeting is available to the public on the City's YouTube channel, eGovPDX, www.portlandoregon.gov slash video and channel 30. The public can also provide written testimony council by emailing the council clerk at cctestimony at portlandoregon.gov. The council is taking these steps as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and the need to limit in-person contact and promote physical distancing. The pandemic is an emergency that obviously threatens the public's health, safety, and welfare, which requires us to meet remotely by electronic communications. Thank you all for your continued patience, flexibility, and understanding as we manage through this challenging situation to do the city's business. And with that, we will hear from legal counsel on the rules of order and decorum. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Mayor. To participate in council meetings, you may sign up in advance with the council clerk's office for communications to briefly speak about any subject. You may also sign up for public testimony and resolutions or the first readings of ordinances. The published council agenda at portlandoregon.gov forward slash auditor contains information about how and when you may sign up for testimony while the city council is holding electronic meetings. Your testimony should address the matter being considered at the time. When testifying, please state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Please disclose if you're a lobbyist. If you're representing an organization, please identify it. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. When your time is up, the presiding officer will ask you to conclude. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If there are disruptions, a warning will be given that further disruption may result in the person being placed on hold or rejected from the remainder of the electronic meeting. Please be aware that all council meetings are recorded. Thank you. Thank you very much. First up is communications. Carla, I understand we only have one individual here today on communications. That's correct, Mayor. Item okay. 76. Request of Walter Whaler to address council regarding South Park Block's historic nomination, tree succession plan, and the South Park Block's master plan. Welcome. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, you're good to go. Thanks for your patience, Walter. Commissioners, first of all, thank you for your service and thank you for this opportunity to speak to you. I am Walter Weiler, chair of the Downtown Neighborhood Association, so-called DNA. Our area is bordered by the Willamette River, Burnside and 405, the heart of the city. First, I wanna thank Mayor Wheeler for helping the DNA mount a successful forum on homelessness. Thanks for attending. And I wanna thank Commissioner Hardesty for speaking to the DNA recently and urging us to come speak here more frequently. The DNA recognizes the importance of and the demands on your time with major city issues. We are reluctant to take your time on issues that pale in comparison. However, during the pull of these major city issues, city staffs are proceeding with projects that are accumulating significant opposition. We are concerned when these projects are brought for your approval, there will be issues that really should and could be addressed now. The DNA has met with, spoken to, and expressed our concerns to the appropriate city staff leaders. We find them to be intelligent, professional, and competent. They, however, continue to move their projects towards city council with what we believe to be flawed features that should be corrected now. We hope to visit each of you soon, but my message today is a heads up on these two issues. First of all, the South Park Master Plan. The plan will reduce the number of healthy towering elm trees that give this 12 blocks their signature leafy canopy and that cleans the air for 15,000 city residents. B, the plan will root, 
the bicycle green loop along and inside part of the today's park, shrinking the park, endangering pedestrians with a moving vehicle threat and reducing the park's pedestrian experience and safety. The plan will reduce the historically physical size of the park. This plan should be paused until a historic designation is complete and a separate tree succession plan can be prepared. The second project of our concern is the Southwest River Place development. River Place will, in it, during its construction, River Place will displace 300 missing middle rental apartment residents for up to two years. More importantly, or equally importantly, River Place will overload the two-lane Southwest River Parkway, which is the only northern exit entrance for the entire South Waterfront which is fast adding density. River Place should be paused until PBOT and ODOT complete a traffic study to show if the area's infrastructure can accommodate River Place's increased density. The DNA welcomes the opportunity to, to work on these and other projects with you. Thank you for your time and consideration and thank you for the coaching on ORCIDs. I appreciate it. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. And I hope you take Commissioner Fritz's uh, advice on gardening, not mine. I do. Thank you. Thank you for your patience, Walter. And thank you for your good thoughts. We sure appreciate it. And uh, Carla, uh, first up then is the consent agenda. I understand two items have been pulled, 688, 690. Is that correct? That is correct, Mayor. Anything else? I've had no other requests. Very good. Please call the roll on the remainder of the consent agenda. Hardesty? Aye. Udaly? Aye. Fritz? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. The consent agenda is adopted. Thank you very much. This gets us to our first time certain item, item number 677, please, Carl. Hmm. Authorize eight grant agreements and intergovernmental agreements related to the Community Watershed Stewardship Program for a cumulative total of up to $100,000. Colleagues, since 1995, Environmental Services Community Watershed Stewardship Program has helped Portlanders create very positive changes in their neighborhoods and communities while improving the health of our watersheds. In 2012, CWSP performed an equity analysis and added award criteria for leadership from underrepresented communities. And in 2015, the program began a partnership with the Indigenous Nation Studies Department at Portland State University to bring ecological insight to the Bureau and provide a grant coordination internship for emerging leaders. Today's ordinance will authorize work with eight community organizations each project improves watershed health and supports the Bureau of Environmental Services as it strives to intentionally become an anti-racist organization. Daryl Hauptman from Environmental Services is going to introduce our invited guests and they'll provide us with a brief presentation. Thank you all for being here today. Daryl, take it away. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler and City Council members. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, come before you and share the latest from the Quisp program. Uh, the mayor noted uh, we're in our 25th year, I believe, uh, over 300 community-led projects supported by the Quisp program all over Portland. Uh, this morning, we've come to share the good news about some wonderful action that's in the works uh, from some truly awesome Portlanders. This year's slate of grantees includes a combination of old and new emerge this year that emphasizes this is community building and future leadership. Uh, with that, I'll hand off to Portland State University professor, uh, Judy Bluehorse Skelton. And um, Carla, do you have our presentation loaded? Uh, if not, I will. No, thanks, Keelan. Yeah, I'll pull it up in just a moment. Thank you. Can you advance the slide, please? Hmm. Take it uh, away, Judy. Tots may we. Good morning. Um, thank you, 
Mayor Wheeler and commissioners um, for this opportunity to share some of the highlights <clears throat> of this um, really unique relationship. The partnership with the QUIS program and BES has um, had a dramatic influence on our Indigenous Nations Studies Department, including the recent approval by the state legislature to agree to the remodel of our old science building, which will be integrating Indigenous science as a key part of that. These partnerships with the city are have helped to inform our dean, our president, other faculty and students who are looking to do these kinds of really innovative work and partnership together with different agencies, especially when we look at um, indigenous, traditional, ecological and cultural knowledge, which is a very comprehensive, multidisciplinary um, practice. Um, I'm really excited that the students uh, continue to um, serve and find a voice, um, bring indigenous perspectives while they're outreaching to um, marginalized and historically underserved communities. Uh, across the Portland area to work on these issues on land, water, healthy soils, healthy people. And so um, it's integrated into a lot of our course curriculum. These relationships have become part of PSU's community-based learning and are um, as well as continuing to let knowledge serve the city and community engagement. And so um, I'm very excited uh, that Al Rose and Naomi Rodriguez are this year's two fellowships, paid internships, uh, as they um, begin to take these on, engage with community, and becomes part of new career pathways that have redefined what Native American studies and Indigenous Nation studies is nationally and internationally, as others come to us here in the Portland area to say, how are you partnering? How are you doing this? How are you integrating these um, ancestral ways and working together with bureaus? It's an exciting time. It's a challenging time, but it's an exciting time. I'm um, really honored to uh, introduce Al Rose today who will continue with this uh, presentation and just know that <clears throat> these slides don't capture the energy and all of the people that are getting out onto the sites um, in the area. So Al, thank you for being here this morning. Um, I know we have a lot going on in our communities and a lot of communities and um, difficult times, but I really appreciate your uh, courage and endurance. So uh, Al, take it away. Got there, Abena. Uh, good morning, my name is Allison Rose. I go by Al. I am the student coordinator for the Quist program this year. Um, I'd like to thank council for their time this morning to watch our presentation. Uh, we have eight grant projects and each one brings an important environmental project for the community and Portland at large. Um, uh, can we go to the next slide? Our first project, um, they're not in any order, but the first one I'm talking about is by Portland Opportunity Industrial Center partnered with Rosemary Anderson High School. Um, they have a student crew leader training program that's partnered with Friends of Trees in Portland Parks to teach natural resource project management through a career track mentorship, and it prepares them to lead adult volunteers in stewardship activities at Wilkes Headwaters and other restoration sites. Um, and I was told that this photo is from the Children's Arboretum back in 2016, and they were doing a similar project. Um, the next group is Lower Columbia Estuary Partnership with the, Blue Bear, or blah, the Blueprint Foundation. Um, so LSEP's continued partnership develops its pipeline of mentees. They'll continue to mentor two to three youth of color from the Blueprint Foundation on three paddle trips near the Willamette Columbia confluence and the youth will gather marine debris data. They'll teach marine ecology, um, both to each other and their community. They'll learn about flora and fauna, the food web, and they'll monitor different techniques about uh, how to monitor all of the debris. Um, they'll also learn about GIS data collection, management, and analysis. Uh, next slide. The next group is ACO, or African Youth and Community Organization. 
this is a capacity and leadership building project. Uh, it's centered around Johnson Creek uh, with two Somali youth ambassadors, the Johnson Creek Watershed Council, Leech Botanical Gardens and ACOS coordinator will participate in a train the trainer type program with two youth who graduate from ACOS leadership program. Um, and later in the year, they'll steward a five acre plot above Leech Gardens, which is out in East Portland. Um, and the next group is outside in. They have one location in downtown near PSU. And I think they're building a new location in East Portland. So this project is houseless young adults leading research, designing and building a backyard habitat in uh, outside in downtown uh, campus. They'll have uh, career mentors guiding them. Students will also explore different related fields like bot botany, hydrology, entomology, landscape architecture and design. And the next slide. Uh, the next group is DPAVE. We've worked with them a number of times. Um, uh, they're partnering with Friends of Trees, Portland Parks, RH Construction, and multiple high schools. They'll convene uh, with the communities near Oliver and Bridger Elementary School in the Centennial School District. They'll help design rain gardens, gathering places, nature play spaces, and naturescaping. It's about 3,400 square feet of pavement removal that they'll be replacing with stormwater greenery. Um, and let's see. The next one is Sacred Lands Alliance. So this one is probably one of my favorite projects and it's led by two native elders and they'll be guiding restoration of forest and savanna lands. Um, this is located in Southwest Portland. They'll also provide nature walks in an educational forum uh, leading up to Tryon Creek. There will be a staff member that will mentor a student or two to lead restoration work on the farm, um, and they'll have volunteer work parties. Uh, next slide. Uh, next up is Camp Elso. They'll be partnering with the Blueprint Foundation, Beam Village and Village Gardens, and Youth of Color graduates from Tap and Roots Internship Program. And so these groups will teach children to be environmental stewards by leading their spring break excursions, and they'll be focusing on the STEM field. Um, and then the children and community will see lots of leaders emerge from these programs. And then Tryon Creek Watershed Council, they'll be partnering with Cascade Education Corps, Oregon Refugee Child Children's Assistance and Portland Community College's botany classes. Um, and then Tryon Creek will be teaching watershed science and hands-on restoration in a few different workshops. Um, and they'll also like train these students to help continue the stewardship. And do we have a slide after this or is this the last one? No? Okay. I think that's all of our grants for this year. So if council has any presentations for our, our team. Very good. Thank you for that presentation. We appreciate it. Commissioner Hardesty. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you both for your presentation. Al, I had a couple of questions for you. Um, so how long have you been involved with this program? I started last September, um, but I heard about it at the beginning of spring of last year, um, and I got involved through Judy. Do. Oh, I got involved through, through Judy, of course, of yeah. course. Uh, and um, you speak so knowledgeably about uh, the work that's being done. Um, I, I don't want to put you on a spot and ask you. Uh, uh, if you have your college degree yet, uh, but uh, uh, in your education currently, are you envisioning using this knowledge um, in your future? Uh, yeah, I think one of my main goals is to return back home. So I'm Diné or Navajo in Karak. Um, and last summer I did a lot of environmental justice work on the Navajo reservation with a group of other like Navajo youth. Excellent. And I want to help some of my friends do land restoration and uh, like cultural revitalization work. Uh, and I'm hoping that this experience in grant work will help me write grants for them and uh, like help develop programs with them for like Dine youth. 
So Al, you continue to remind me our future's in great hands if the adults don't screw it up before we give it to you. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Judy, for your incredible work um, over the years and keeping this program not just surviving, but thriving. Um, I can't think of a better investment of a mere $100,000 than creating these opportunities that uh, spark uh, young folks like Al uh, to actually imagine how they can give back uh, to their culture, to their community, um, and how they can lead us in the future that we all want to make. So I, I, I just can't say enough about uh, how impressive you are, Al. And whatever you do, you're going to be awesome. So thanks for being here today. Yeah, I, I, I want to build on that theme. I, I'm really impressed by uh, not only the presentation and the program. And Judy, I really thank you for that, the leadership and structure. It's obviously a meaningful program. But Al, it sounds to me like this, this has really sparked a long-term interest for you. It sound, sounds like this could actually be something that you really dedicate your future to. Um, I wouldn't say it sparked it. I've had these goals and visions since I was a kid because I think Indigenous youth are the future and I think Indigenous knowledge and visions are the future. That's awesome. I, I'm laughing now because you said since you were a kid, right? And like, I'm an old woman. So. I was going to leave that one alone, Commissioner. I <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Like, Allison, if, if you're 40, you're a kid to me. I mean, that's, <laughs> but thank you. We really appreciate it. And, and uh, thank you for coming in and sharing with all of us, not just on the city council, but others more broadly in the community about this opportunity and how tremendous it is. And uh, thank you for your leadership. Very good. Uh, do we have any public testimony on this item? No one signed up, Mayor. Very good. This is a emergency ordinance. Carla, please call the roll. Hardesty. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. You daily. Well, uh, thank you, Judy and Hal, for your presentations. This is just a beautiful way to start uh, our morning. I'm really excited about the work that B BES is doing and PSU are doing with these community organizations. I love the focus on youth empowerment and racial equity. I just lost my place in my notes. Here we go. And, and I think it's a great example of how we should be doing uh, work community work as a city. I also want to highlight and praise the roles these grants play in addressing the effects of colonization, in this case, on the Tualatin Kalapuya and the Clackamas Chinook who inhabited these lands. So thank you to the Sacred Lands Alliance and all the community organizations who are working to make this possible. I vote aye. Prince. Thank you, each of you, for being here and for participating in this program. In addition to the kudos that my colleagues have given, which I which I echo, um, I remember that the late Commissioner Fish kept this program going in the middle of the recession and insisted that the funding continue. And so it's good that we now continue to have it and um, have really developed the program over the 12 years that I've uh, been involved and, and uh, have returned the focus to where it should be in terms of who benefits and who was impacted and how do we move forward um, more constructively. So thank you very much, everybody. I. Wheeler. Oh, this is a great program. I'm, I'm very happy to support it. And uh, again, Judy and Al, thank you both for being here today. This is a, a great partnership between the city, Portland State University, the participants, uh, well done, everybody who's worked so hard on this. I'm very happy to vote aye, and the ordinance is approved. Thank you. The next item, Carla, is item 678, time certain. Amend the building demolition code to move implementation details to the administrative rule, update as asbestos requirements to conform to state regulations, update demolition inspections language to be consistent with current practices, increase funds for non-compliance, and make other modifications for clarity and consistency, and amend fee schedule. Colleagues, thank, uh, thank you, Carla. Today, I am requesting that the council adopt amendments to the residential demolition ordinance. 
In February, you'll recall that we heard a report that included recommendations to amend the demolition ordinance. Since that time, the Bureau of Development Services has had their staff meeting with a, a range of uh, stakeholders, including the Oregon Health Authority, the Department of Environmental Quality, the Multnomah County Health Department, contractors, architects, neighborhood representatives, and other stakeholders to draft changes to the ordinance and the accompanying administrative rule. The program was created to address the potential impacts on neighbors of dust and debris from residential demolitions. This ordinance improves the program by simplifying the language, making sure the people performing the demolition work are properly qualified to do that work, ensuring that asbestos and lead-based paint materials are properly removed and disposed of. Also, in response to the council's input based on the demolition report in February, BDS is proposing changes to the fines and enforcement as well. These include separating the types of violations into those that are correctable versus those that are deemed to be not correctable, like demolishing the building before BDS has a chance to complete the inspections to verify that regulations are being met. Significantly increasing the fines for non-correctable violations and making the terminology clear and consistent to avoid the potential for confusion. Because this ordinance moves many of the details of the program to administrative rule, BDS staff has included the draft rules as an exhibit and provided a code and commentary document that explains the code changes and have references to where things were moved from the code towards administrative rule. With that, Beth Benton and Mike Byfield with the Bureau of Development Services are here to present on the ordinance. They're also available, obviously, to answer any questions after their presentation. Beth and Mike, welcome. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioners. If you'll give me one moment, I'm going to share my screen. I need permission to share my screen. Is somebody working on uh, making sure that Beth has that? Yes, it looks like uh, we have the settings so that panelists share their screen. Let me double check here. Okay. All right, Beth, go ahead and try it now. Ah, beautiful. Thank you. Thanks. Looks good. Great. Thanks, Keelan. Again, my name is Beth Benton. I am the Com Property Compliance Division Manager with BDS, and also presenting with me today is Mike Leefield, Supervisor for BDS. And Nancy Thornton, BDS Policy Analyst, is also available to assist with questions. Finally, we are pleased to have with us today two active members of the Demolition Stakeholder Workgroup, Larry Helen Kincaid, former Chair of the Development Review and Advisory Committee, formerly known as DRAC, along with Jeff Fish of Construction Northwest, an active member of the Home Builders Association. So for today's presentation, we will summarize the substantive changes in the proposed amendments related to the Residential Demolition Code, including a brief overview of the recommendations and discussions which began almost a year ago. Video staff met with a variety of stakeholders and technical advisors over a span of 12 months to produce the ordinance before you today. Everyone agreed that the amendments for both chapter 24.55 and the administrative rule for residential demolitions should strengthen the requirements and improve our inspections process, ensure that our code language is clear, and further reduce the opportunity for potentially hazardous dust to impact adjacent and nearby homes. As you know, the residential demolition program began two years ago in 2018, with Portland leading the nation as we began regulating potential lead-based paint and asbestos hazards resulting from residential demolition activities. In the fall of 2019, the stakeholder groups met again to review the first year of the program and to identify areas for improvement. The main discussions for additional improvements included language clarification, 
requiring a full deconstructive asbestos survey prior to moving forward. And also clarifying site control requirements and improving on the purpose, the requirements, and the timing of the required permit inspections. And this resulted in a recommendation to have four required inspections versus three. So we now have one pre-demolition inspection, which reviews the job site prior to any work starting. And we now have two during demolition work inspections. The first ensures that exterior painted materials have been removed prior to mechanical demolition work. The second during work inspection, and this is the new one, ensures that the project and the contractor are ready to begin mechanical demolition with wedding equipment in place and the inspector is present to watch the wedding system in action. Also, with this second new inspection, we created an optional version of this, which can be done via a live remote video inspection. If the contractor schedules this in advance and has the technical requirements for the remote video inspection. And the last, of course, will be our final inspection, which ensures the site is secure, all the work is complete, debris removed, sewers capped, basements filled, et cetera. The stakeholder group wanted to implement these critical changes in process as soon as possible. So we adopted an interim administrative rule in January of 2020. Then in February of this year, we presented our first year report to council, after which, Meetings with our stakeholder groups continued as we finalized and incorporated the remaining changes and amendments for chapter 24.55 in order to ensure a positive outcome for this critical program. At this point, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Mike Leefield, supervisor for this program, who will walk you through a summary of the main changes. Mike. Thank you, Beth, and good morning, Mayor Wheeler and city commissioners. Uh, this amendment only proposes changes to two sections of Title 24.55, our building demolition section. The amendments focus on updates to the definitions and specifically Section 24.55.205, Site Control Measures and Residential Demolitions. I want to highlight that no changes are proposed to existing regulations relating to demolition delay, housing preservation, and neighborhood notification requirements. As Beth mentioned, the amendments are meant to improve protections for nearby properties and provide clarity for implementation and compliance with residential demolition regulations. To do this, the stakeholder group first worked to update the administrative rule as to how the nuts and bolts of the improved regulations will work. This code amendment is the next step to align the city title to support the proposed administrative rules. <clears throat> this process results in a proposal to move many current implementation details in the city title to the administrative rules. Uh, as Mayor Wheeler mentioned, uh, we have provided a copy of the proposed administrative rules and a code commentary showing how the sections have been moved around, explaining all the changes that were made for your reference. Major changes to permit approval requirements, including conducting a full asbestos inspection or survey and abatement prior to a home's demolition and requiring all persons, including homeowners doing their own work to obtain lead-based paint certifications to increase safety during exterior painted material removal during demolition. Uh, next slide, please, Beth. Can we advance the slide, Beth? Not working. Okay. There we go, sorry. Okay, great. Uh, one important site control measure during demolition is ensuring proper wetting standards to control dust. Uh, the improved required inspection verification for wetting systems during mechanical demolition uh, was implemented in January of 2020 with the adoption of an interim admin rule, as Beth mentioned. Uh, the proposed code amendment updates city title to support the improved required inspection verification process. While not specifically described in this code amendment, it is important to note that the proposed administrative rules to accompany the code propose to strengthen the current dust suppression requirements by requiring the wet, wet, wet 
demolition dust control method. Uh, demolition sites will now be required to pre-wet. We call that the wet number one. They need to wet the entire structure in it and inside the structure through existing exterior openings to coat the maximum amount of material to be demolished. This is something an inspector will verify. Active wetting, wet number two, must be performed at all times during mechanical demolition activity. Water spray must be concentrated on the demolition equipment at all points of contact with the structure. This is the second during demolition inspection that we will verify at the start of the mechanical demolition. Finally, material wetting, the third wet, uh, is required during and after demolition to provide a final application of moisture to keep particles bound together prior to removal and transfer. Next slide, please, Beth. The administrative rule proposes a significant change to the current enforcement process for violations of the site control requirements in residential demolitions. The current process since adoption in July 2018 has utilized a, a correction notice only with no fines for first violations. In other words, a warning for all responsible parties first offenses. Next slide, please. We are now proposing two categories of fines based on whether or not the violation can be corrected with more punitive fines being issued for those violations which pose a greater risk for damage. For non-correctable violations, which is your section on the right column, we are proposing to discontinue a correction notice with no fine and are increasing the graduated fine amounts. Non-correctable violations will receive a first citation and a $10,000 fine. Non-correctable violations are violations where potential harm or damage has occurred and which cannot be undone. Examples would include performing mechanical demolition with exterior painted materials still on the structure or performing mechanical demolition activity without wetting for dust control. For correctable violations, which is on the left, uh, the blue left table of the graphic, we are proposing to retain a correction notice with no fine for the first violation. Subsequent correctable violations would result in citations and a lower fine amount than correctable violations. A good example of a correctable violation would be not having the correct type of plastic in place for hand removal of exterior painted materials, or if the plastic that was pre-laid out was unintentionally altered so it did not extend to the required 10 feet during the hand removal of materials. In those situations, the responsible party is attempting to comply with the regulations and field adjustments can be made to come into compliance while the work is happening. Next slide, please. So we have a graphic here to try to describe how the two categories of violations would work. Um, the first thing to mention is that the enforcement citations and fines remain attached to the responsible party, the person responsible for doing the work. These fines are not limited to the property where the violation occurred. The citations and fines are graduated and escalate for subsequent violations. As there are two categories for violation types, correctable and non-correctable, both categories need to be tracked and applied separately. This slide is meant to illustrate how the proposed fines would be applied to a responsible party on projects throughout the city. To walk you through the scenario, number one, it shows a responsible party committing a non-correctable violation at site A. This is the first non-correctable violation and results in the first citation and a $10,000 fine. At the next site, site B, the same responsible party is found to have a correctable violation and this violation results in a correction notice only and no fine. Later at a different site, site C, the same responsible party is found to have another non-correctable violation. And this results in a second citation and a $15,000 fine. Scenario two is very similar, but it shows in reverse how the responsible party may receive fines for multiple correctable violations. Um, at this point, I wanna let people know if they have any questions about the proposed enforcement process. We can handle those questions now or at the end of our presentation. Very good. Does anybody have any questions at this point or should we keep pushing forward? I don't see any questions at this point. Why don't you go ahead, Mike? Okay. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler. 
So uh, we're moving on. Um, as a result of moving sections of 2455 of the administrative rule, we were able to achieve a better flow of process and information and able to separate asbestos and lead requirements for greater clarity. Specifically, we have added uh, to the proposed administrative rule three new appendices. Appendix A, which clarifies additional testing, survey, and abatement requirements of all asbestos in compliance with DEQ regulations prior to commencement of permitted demolition work. Appendix B includes testing and sampling requirements to obtain an exemption from the lead hazard reduction measures that more closely resemble current EPA and HUD requirements, and also clarifies who can perform these types of inspections and what information the report must contain. Unless the requirements of the new Appendix B are satisfied, all pre-1978 structures are presumed to be lead containing and must follow the lead hazard reduction measures. Finally, Appendix C organizes references of all the required certifications that, um, that are required to obtain and complete permitted demolition work. The intention of this move and the admin rule and with the appendices is to make the city title and the accompanying administrative rule easy to follow for staff reviewers, inspectors, and customers. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Beth. Thank you, Mike. In conclusion, there were several other suggestions from, st from the stakeholder meetings that everyone agreed would be beneficial. And as a result, BDS staff have agreed to work on the following initiatives. One, the creation of additional safety and best practices information for all residents. This information will be available on our web pages and handouts and by updating the required notices contractors must deliver. Number two, we plan to explore partnering with area college and university programs for field sampling and air monitoring during demolition activities in order to collect data for use in measuring the success of our program. And we hope to begin this um, once our current COVID pandemic subsides. Three, we're gonna explore if our current technology has the capability to provide email or text alerts to neighbors when a mechanical demolition is scheduled through our online permitting system. And finally, we're gonna begin discussion with, discussions with industry stakeholders and interested members of DRAC, DEQ, and OHA for starters to explore the possibility of also regulating dust and potential lead-based paint hazards with regard to commercial demolitions. And we hope to begin these meetings within the next few months. Finally, next steps. Once the code amendments before you today have been adopted, we will publish our draft administrative rule for hearing and public comment. And we plan to let the mayor's staff know when we are ready to publish. We thank you for this opportunity to present our proposed amendments. And finally, to close out our presentation today will be active stakeholders, Mary Helen Kincaid, former chair of DRAC, followed by Jeff Fish, local contractor and longstanding active member of the Home Builders Association, both of whom would like to offer a statement regarding these changes to the residential demolition code and program. Afterwards, we're available to answer any questions. Mary Helen, the floor is yours. I'm sorry, could I ask a question just before we yeah, go there? Commissioner Hardesty, sorry, I was sure. on mute. Go ahead. Don't worry, thank you, Mayor. Um, I actually, uh, what I wanted to do is make a statement. I know the last time we were having this conversation, um, uh, a lot has happened since you last presented these code changes to the city council, right? I don't have to tell you that. I just wanna tell you how much I appreciate how much work you've done in spite of all the crises the city of Portland has confirmed since we last started this conversation. I am really, really impressed that you have actually, uh, from what I've been able to read, you've actually embraced many of the um, issues that were of concern the last time you presented to the city council. So I just want you to know, I, I, I remember all of us were being bombarded with emails just as the pandemic hit. Um, and I just want to appreciate the fact that people don't see that their work continues behind the scene, whether we have a pandemic, an economic crisis, or a racial, uh, racially charged uh, uh, movement taking place. So I just want to appreciate the hard work. 
um, and the thoughtfulness under which you're bringing us back to the city council. I applaud your team and this work. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm Mary Helen Kincaid, and as Beth said, um, a former chair of DRAC, as was Jeff Fish. I followed him. Uh, I wanted to give you just a brief history, but before I did that, I want to really say how humbled I am and echo Commissioner Hardesty's comments about Al Rose and her um, expertise at such a young age. Uh, I, I envy that. I don't think there's any chance for me now at 69 to be anywhere close to that, but um, what a wonderful accomplishment in addition to our city. And yes, um, as Commissioner Udaly said, what a great way to start this meeting. I think I have some good news for you too. So um, thank you, Mayor and Commissioners for taking the time to listen to this. It's, I think I have some, I think fairly good news. I've been involved, as some of you know, in very contentious issues in the city, airport futures, overhead approach, demolition code, all of those things, and involved in a number of um, community committees. So I, I've seen the worst and the best of us uh, in community meetings. I think that this committee, uh, staffed by BDS and primarily in the very beginning by Nancy Thornton, uh, did an excellent job of bringing really diverse people to the table from people that didn't want another house in Portland demolished to those that purported to uh, accuse people of wanting to have every house demolished. So we were able to start this in 2014, I believe, 13 people started talking about asbestos and lead. It was brought up at community meetings. And fast forward to today where we've made, I think, um, tremendous accomplishments. Beth um, alluded to the fact that Portland is the first city, I don't know if only is true anymore, uh, that has regulations about, city regulations about asbestos and lead. It uh, has been an iterative process along the way by taking bits and pieces of conversations. Uh, it's not always been easy. It's not always been fun, but I think in the end, I'm very proud of the work that we did, that DRAC did, that all the people that came along with us did. The um, stakeholders should, it's one of those situations that I think you all well know where nobody's happy and nobody's really all that mad. Uh, we, we came to a middle ground and BDS staff uh, worked wholeheartedly and even in the latest times during these difficult challenges we're facing, kept at the work, uh, didn't step away from it and it's protecting our citizens. I'm particularly happy with the initiative, one more that's come out of this. Uh, this all one step back in history, it all started because Robert McCullough from Eastmoreland came to a DRAC meeting and said, you have to stop demolitions. And from there, we landed here today uh, with the idea that now we can look at commercial deconstruction, um, not deconstruction, sorry, demolitions and the effect. I live within a half mile of Portland Meadows. And when they tore Portland Meadows down, we were covered with a dust cloud and I'm quite sure there was asbestos in it no air quality testing on my part, but I'm glad that we're looking at that because we received numerous complaints about people living next to commercial buildings and there being no controls. So I look forward to their work on that. Um, and the, I wish the new stakeholder group, uh, good luck. Uh, it's, uh, this effort was um, rewarding in the fact that we faced a difficult problem with diverse stakeholders. Uh, there wasn't a group left untouched that wasn't. Um, there's 97 neighborhoods, and I think we visited over the course of the uh, six years, I think we visited over 50 of them. So I'm pleased with that effort to involve many, many voices and not suffer the criticism of just some people in a back room made a decision. So I thank you for your efforts in supporting this. I think that um, you should all be proud of the work that your city employees have done for you through all the various commissioners, a couple mayors, and uh, it, this is a good point. We did a good thing and uh, it's going to protect the citizens of Portland. 
Thank you, Mary Helen, and, and it's never too late. So don't don't count yourself out yet. There's there's a lot left to give, and thank you for that perspective. We really uh, I'm really enjoying my backyard and my garden because I always say my radishes don't talk back. Well, goodness, where were you uh, when we were discussing gardening earlier? We could have used your sage advice. <laughs> well, I, I was really upset when I heard the um, Commissioner Fritz, because I know she has some beautiful orchids, but I missed that whole story. So <laughs> I'll have to get it later. It, uh, we'll, we'll give you the whole down low on it. Thank you for your, your, uh, your participation in this. And does that, uh, does that complete the formal presentation? I believe uh, Mr. Fish would like to make a statement. You bet. Go ahead, Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it's always somewhat troublesome to follow Mary Helen because she steals your thunder. <laughs> um, I have to thank uh, Nancy, Mike, and Beth, especially Nancy. Uh, I've sat on a lot of committees over the years, and this was one of the harder ones to keep us all focused and on, uh, on our mission to, to get it done. So uh, she did a great job. Um, my only concern of what was produced is the degree of the fines. And that's not to belittle uh, the importance of keeping asbestos and lead and other things out of the air you know, off neighboring properties, but some of those fines rival or exceed what you have for fines in DEQ and OSHA for things that could actually cause death. And, and what I'm concerned about is uh, coupled with the deconstruction that um, Sean Wood uh, has done, we've seen some uh, minority uh, uh, companies get involved in the deconstruction. Deconstruction's pretty easy to get into. Uh, you, you know, you need a truck and a crowbar basically. And I know there's at least one female uh, group that got certified and I use a deconstructor that is uh, Hispanic. I'm a little concerned with the, the degree of the fines and the, and the amount of the fines uh, that it might scare some of those people away from wanting to, to take on a job where they, they might misunderstand some of the regulations. I'll give you an example. Mike talked about having to have uh, uh, plastic out 10 feet from the house. Well, <clears throat> when you get on a five foot side yard setback, you can only go five feet and then you got to go vertical. And even though I sat on the committee, I can't sit here today and tell you how far vertically you got to go on that. I think it's 10 feet, but I could be wrong. Um, I just recently tore down, had a home deconstructed that cost me 22.5 to, to do it. And that included backfilling about six feet of a basement. Um, when you've got a job that's 22.5 and you can possibly take a 10 or $15,000 fine because you misunderstand something. Um, I think that's a pretty enough, pretty tough nut to chew. I'd like to see those fine amounts reduced, maybe take a look at them, staff take a look at them after a year or two. And uh, if they feel they need to be ratcheted up, ratchet them up at that time. But I think in some respects, um, it could scare off some, some minority contractors that might want to get in the business. And, uh, I think that's pretty much the end of my comments. Uh, one last one is um, Commissioner Fritz and I have gone head to head over some issues clear back when she's on the Planning Commissioner Commission. And Commissioner, I wanna thank you for your service. We, are, we often were on opposite sides of an issue, but uh, you're always professional about it. And, and uh, I appreciate your service to the city. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, I appreciate that. Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, and that completes the presentation, is that correct? Yes, sir. Very good. Carla, is there any public testimony for this item? Uh, we did not have anybody sign up for this one. All right, uh, unless there's any other questions from my colleagues, and I don't see any, this is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Thank you all for your presentations today, fantastic. Next up, Carla, is uh, time certain item number 679. We're right on schedule. Amend contract with F. Hurdle Consulting LLC in the amount of $15,000 to provide additional community stakeholder 
Engagement Consulting Services. Colleagues, on June 27, 2019, a contract was entered into between both the City of Portland and FC Hurdle Consulting LLC to provide community stakeholder engagement services in the development of a digital equity action plan. The original contracted amount was $17,000, $17,150, with an expiration date of May 27th, 2020. Additional consulting services are required in order to adjust the strategies and methods used to engage community stakeholders in a safe, physically distanced manner. In addition, in line with the city's equity-based framework for engaging with residents, additional consulting services are needed to identify and engage with residents who face barriers to internet adoption. The contract not to exceed amount of $17,150 is increased by $15,000 to a new total not to exceed amount of $32,150. We have Elizabeth Perez from the Office for Community Technology here to answer any questions. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you, Mayor. It's good to be with all of you today. Um, so yes, I'm here to answer any questions, but I'll give you a, a quick uh, history of this contract. So as the mayor pointed out, uh, we entered into this contract with Hurdle Consulting in June of 2019. Um, the original statement of work anticipated that we would engage with community stakeholders through a reflections event of uh, the DIN phase one. And then after the development of the draft plan for phase two, we would again follow up uh, with the DIN members and other community leaders. Um, so we did come to council in June to try to expand the contract. Um, we had cost savings from last year that uh, we felt we could use towards um, this contract. In this fiscal year, we have a little bit less. Um, so just a little bit of background for the city's digital equity budget for this year, we have about $40,000. So we're using about half uh, to fund this work because we think it is incredibly critical to the, the long-term strategy for uh, our office and the city's digital equity work. So in addition to the complications we have faced from COVID and trying to engage with our community stakeholders, we really shifted the work um, of Hurdle Consulting to do more training for staff um, and the DIN members and to do additional outreach to additional uh, organizations currently doing the work in the community that would benefit from being part of the DIN and the next phase of the Digital Equity Action Plan um, and that we would be able to assist them as well. Um, so uh, just a little bit about the timeline. We hope to bring the MHCRC, Technology Community Needs Ascertainment, and the Municipal Broadband Feasibility Study to you all soon. Uh, with that, uh, we hope to preview our intentions for phase two of the DEEP that we believe uh, will respond to the needs ascertainment as well as the broadband feasibility study. Um, so in June, starting in June and through September, we've been working with our library and our county partners to draft phase two. Um, we're hoping that this month through October, Hurdle will be able to start uh, leading the community engagement. Um, and then November, we would come back to present phase two of the DEEP to city council, the county board and the library board. So we've asked this item to be heard on emergency just because of the time constraints. The Hurdle team has had to put their work on pause while we figure out our next course of action. So I'd like to allow them to begin this work uh, immediately upon passing. Um, I do have uh, Conrad Hurdle here um, to, to also share a few words. Welcome. Conrad, are you here? I don't know if he's been able to log on, but I can answer any questions uh, that any of you may have in the meantime. Very good. Colleagues, any questions on this? I'm not seeing any questions. It looks pretty straightforward, Elizabeth. Uh, is there anybody testify, uh, signed up to testify on this item, Carla? No one signed up, Mayor. All right, very good. We'll call the roll. Hardesty? Elizabeth, I want to really appreciate uh, your thoughtfulness and um, hearing what was said at the last time you brought this in front of us. 
reaching out to me, um, having a conversation with my office. I, I totally support the direction you were going, as I told you uh, when you testified the first time. Uh, my concerns have been addressed. Um, and I, I still just think you are an absolute superstar and we are very lucky to have you here at the city of Portland. And so I am very happy to vote aye today um, on this measure and look forward to uh, the work of your consulting team and then you coming back to tell us what's next. I vote aye. You daily. Well, thanks for the presentation, Elizabeth. It's nice to see you and I vote aye. Fritz. Thank you very much. I'm really pleased to see the digital equity work continue to move forward. Um, we have to do it one step at a time, and that's what you're doing. So thank you. Aye. Wheeler. Thanks, Elizabeth. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Thank you for the presentation. Next to the regular agenda, Carla, item number 693. Authorize the Bureau of Environmental Services to enter into an intergovernmental agreement with the City of Lake Oswego to, co to cooperate on a potential replacement of the Trion Creek Wastewater Treatment Plant via a public-private partnership. Colleagues, the Bureau of Environmental Services manages our two wastewater treatment facilities, the Tryon Creek Water White Wait. The Tryon Creek Wastewater Treatment Plant is located in Lake Oswego and services about 20,000 customers in Southwest Portland, along with customers in unincorporated Multnomah County in Lake Oswego. Through an IGA that dates back to 1984. The plant has been owned, maintained, and operated by the city of Portland. The plant is in dire condition. This interim IGA allows the city of Portland and the city of Lake Oswego to enter a procurement process for a public-private partnership to design, build, operate, and maintain a replacement sewer treatment plant with the city of Lake Oswego. Here to provide us with more information is Jonas Beery from Environmental Services. Jonas, welcome, thank you, please take it away. Great, thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, I'm gonna work on uh, seeing if I can share my screen here to get this presentation up. Uh, I believe this should get it uh, on the screen appropriately. Uh, so uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you you uh, te teed up the uh, first slide uh, pretty well. Uh, kind of a summary, uh, I apologize here if I can get back to the right screen. Uh, a summary of kind of where, where we are, uh, just a visual to orient everyone of the plant as you described construction in, constructed in 1964, managed under a 1984 intergovernmental agreement. Uh, to orient you here to the picture, this is kind of the, the northern end of Lake Oswego, just as 43 uh, enters uh, along the river and becomes State Street uh, there in Lake Oswego, and it's obviously along the Willamette River. Um, you can see there the, the capacity treatment. Uh, important note that uh, the, the customer split that you described, Mayor, uh, about 35% of the capacity of, of wastewater that comes through the plant uh, is about 35% from City of Portland, 65% uh, from Lake Oswego. So uh, keep that in, in mind as we go through the presentation here. Um, the key uh, objective of the current interim IGA that's before you is really to allow this project uh, to continue to the next step. Uh, so it's been under discussion for quite a while, uh, kind of fits and starts with Lake Oswego uh, uh, and obviously with, with, with us here in Portland. Um, we're really at a point now where, where we, and when I say we, it's, it's Lake Oswego, but, but in agreement with City of Portland are going out for a request for proposals. So this interim IGA starts to refine uh, the thoughts about the path forward so that we can get the request for proposals out uh, and officially get proposals from the uh, qualified bidders. There's three teams of qualified bidders that have been identified. Uh, the uh, RFP information will really provide us the technical details and financial details so we can collectively, uh, as, as uh, two cities, make a determination about whether this makes sense and, and indications are, are currently that it will, which is why we support going forward with the RFP. Um, to tee up, um, this is a pretty confusing uh, arrangement, so we tried to kind of simplify it here, uh, but this is the current arrangement. Uh, the, the green boxes uh, on the left, City of Portland does it all. Uh, we design and build the improvements. Of course, we do that via typically via contracts. We hold the permit uh, for the outfall into the Willamette River. We own the land, we own the facility and equipment, uh, and we're responsible for operating and maintaining uh, the plant and financing any of the improvements. 
we then have the existing IGA uh, under which the city of Lake Oswego pays us, uh, pays uh, to the city of Portland for their share of the cost. It's a somewhat complicated formula, but uh, effectively it's a 50-50 kind of a cost share um, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, Lake Oswego uh, contributes uh, via that existing IGA, uh, which is quite, uh, quite old. So the new uh, arrangement, if this were to go forward, if the RFP is successful and ultimately we get to a new, uh, a new treatment plant, uh, what would happen, Lake Oswego uh, would build uh, a new plant uh, and it would completely flip the relationship. So uh, the opposite of the slide I just showed uh, on the left, the city of Portland would pay our share of costs, uh, something closer to that 35% uh, of our usage uh, to Lake Oswego. Lake Oswego would own the land, would own the facilities and equipment uh, and would hold the permit uh, be a new a new permit uh, uh, under uh, DQ rules. Uh, there would be a new IGA. That's not the IGA in front of us today, but that'll be a future IGA uh, in another uh, year to 24 months when that'll be developed. Uh, that will uh, indicate responsibilities there. And then Lake Oswego will have an agreement with a private party. Um, the terminology is DBFOM, as you can see in the blue boxes. That's design, build, uh, finance, operate, and maintain. So. In, uh, um, Simple parlance, this is often called a P3, public-private partnership, uh, but that agreement would be Lake Oswego and the private party and the agreement, future agreement between City of Portland and Lake Oswego is simply for us to make uh, those payments based upon our actual usage. So, so completely flips that relationship, uh, which uh, makes some sense, at least on the surface, uh, because it is in fact in the City of Lake Oswego uh, and serves the majority, uh, the majority of usage is, is the entirety of uh, City of Lake Oswego population. Um, Number of benefits to City of Portland. Um, one important one is it significantly reduces our long-term risks. Um, we no longer have responsibility for the O&M uh, and, and um, challenges that exist because of the underinvestment in the plant. Uh, we would uh, no longer have the long-term risk of needing to drive the capital reinvestment. Uh, and then of course, future regulatory uh, risk would be borne uh, by the per new per permit holder, which would be Lake Oswego. As I mentioned, it betters aligns uh, actual uh, costs that, for City of Portland to actual usage. It does have potential, which we uh, care about, particularly in environmental services and for the city more broadly, has potential to improve the uh, quality of the effluent that returns to the Willamette River. Uh, the new plant, as opposed to just upgrading uh, uh, the existing kind of 1964 plant, the new plant would have uh, uh, potentially some, some more um, advanced uh, capabilities to provide a higher quality uh, return to the river. Um, uh, of course, it supports that innovative technology, a, a unique financial arrangement. Um, last bullet, super important uh, to me and to, and to others as well, is that we've set this up and it's defined in the IGA, uh, interim IGA, that this will be cost neutral uh, and we believe actually better over the long term uh, to the city of Portland, meaning uh, the impact to ratepayers uh, will be at least no more than the status quo if we reinvested in the existing plant. Uh, we believe uh, it actually will be uh, more cost effective for city of Portland and we'll get those details to make that final determination once we have the RFP responses in and a provider selected. Um, just a couple more slides here. Uh, I actually um, borrowed this from uh, Lake Oswego uh, presentation, but this is just kind of a summary of what we just went through, a comparison of the um, uh, in the blue, building a new P3 uh, and keeping the existing plant. And these are all the issues we went through uh, previously um, uh, on the prior slide, uh, the uh, prior slides that describe the difference between the current status and new status. Um, one thing I'll flag that this is important to Lake Oswego being that it's in their city is it does have, uh, at the bottom here, it does have a smaller footprint. Uh, and so um, uh, it's, it has some aesthetic uh, uh, benefit uh, to that area, the foothills area of Lake Oswego. Um, so what if the um, RFP is not successful? Uh, well, the fallback plan is that we would return to the existing IGA. Uh, that IGA does still govern, uh, even during the term of the interim IGA, which really just addresses the RFP. Um, we'd probably want to come back at some point if this uh, didn't proceed, the, the DBFOM P3 didn't proceed, uh, and think about renegotiating some terms of that IGA, but we do think it'll, pr it'll proceed. Um, there is, uh, with this interim IGA, um, Lake Oswego has pretty much covered all of the costs to date uh, in getting to this point. Uh, we will now begin sharing uh, those costs 50-50, uh, but, but most of those costs will actually be rolled into the project cost, if that, um, assuming that proceeds. Um, and, but we would be responsible for our portion of those costs if it did uh, fall, uh, fall uh, to the wayside and we return to status quo. And then of course, we'd update the facilities plan and, and look to implement major uh, reinvestments over 
the next 30 years. We estimate that's about 250 to 350 million with most of that occurring over the next 10 years. So um, pretty major investment needed out there uh, if, if the P3 is not successful. Um, schedule lastly, uh, so this starts in March of this year. Obviously this work started uh, uh, well before then, but, but really in the context of the IGA, um, we've, we've conducted briefings uh, through the spring. Um, Lake Oswego did have a study session at their council July 14th, um, uh, a non-vote, but, but um, I think generally supportive of moving forward. Uh, here we are today on September 9th. Um, Lake Oswego will approve, uh, we, we hope and intend, uh, this same IGA uh, at their city council next week. And then we'll of course have our second uh, reading and vote uh, the following day on the 16th, which will make this IGA, uh, interim IGA effective. Uh, which then allows uh, for the RFP to be released uh, in fall. Timing's a little uncertain. Looks like it'll be mid-October. Uh, and then there's a few more steps. We'll review the RFP. City of Portland will have uh, at least a couple of seats on that RFP panel uh, and review process. And then uh, uh, assuming that successful uh, pre-development um, uh, goes forward. I think um, oh, I do want to mention uh, the uh, oh, sorry, uh, uh, let me, if I can, just go back to the last slide. I want to flag that this is a long-term uh, exercise. Uh, at best, it would be fiscal 23-24 before the uh, new treatment plant would be functional and operational with permit transfer, uh, and then eventually the old plant could be de decommissioned, but, but it is a uh, lengthy process that yet remains. Um, so what the, the key terms that are in the, the proposed interim IGA, um, it establishes roles and responsibilities, most importantly, including some off ramps. Uh, if we decide that uh, this doesn't make sense for financial reasons or, or other reasons, uh, we, we can uh, off ramp uh, of that. And then it starts to kind of preview some of the key concepts that would be in the future IGA, like the share of uh, costs, uh, capping our maximum commitment, um, uh, ensuring that any amounts that were due under the exi uh, that, that are due to City of Portland under the existing IGA uh, are returned to Portland, uh, and then starts to um, uh, define uh, permit responsibility and asset responsibility uh, when that's transferred. Um, so, to, thinking back to the schedule, uh, just so you know where the touch points are for council, uh, this is a, a simplified version of the next steps. We're here at number one, um, highlighted uh, with the orange circle. Um, approval of the interim IGA, which allows for development of uh, pub publication of the RFP and development of the pre-development uh, agreement, uh, will determine along the way whether or not this is feasible. Uh, as we said, if it's not feasible, we'll return to the existing IGA. If it is feasible, uh, there will be uh, a future IGA. And so that point three, um, uh, there will be a future council action uh, to agree, uh, to, to discuss and agree to that future uh, interim uh, governmental agreement, which will then of course allow the P3 uh, to build um, the, the new plant and transfer those operations. Uh, and that is my presentation. So happy to uh, address any uh, questions or concerns that you may have. Very good, colleagues. Questions, concerns? Looks like there are none at this point. Do we have any public testimony on this item? No one signed up, Mayor. Very good. Excellent. I think this is a good solution for a problem that's been with us for some time. And I appreciate the, the work that the Bureau of Environmental Services is doing and the work that you've been doing, Jonas, to try and find a solution for all of this. This has been a thorny issue for a long time. So thank you for not just punting this down to the future once again. Uh, this is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Next item is 694, please, emergency ordinance. Conduct a pilot program for the 2021 citywide charitable campaign to respond to COVID-19 and the racial justice movement, as well as the financial hardship facing city employees and the community. Colleagues, the city's annual charitable campaign provides a means for city employees to contribute to multiple local, state, national, and worldwide funds and federations. The campaign, as you know, usually provides an opportunity for city employees to support various community organizations that serve Portland residents and beyond. COVID-19 has changed everything. As we know, Oregon will continue to contend with the virus well into 2021, and racial equity will continue to be a factor. Communities of color have been disproportionately impacted, 
and underserved and racial equity and justice have become acute issues, not just here in Portland, but all around the world. This ordinance charges the chief administrative officer to conduct a pilot program for the 2021 citywide charitable campaign to respond specifically to COVID-19 and the racial justice movement, as well as financial hardship facing city employees and the community. Janet Storm is here to expand on the matter. On the matter, welcome Janet, how are you today? Good morning, commissioners. Uh, good morning, Mayor. My name is Janet Storm. I'm with the Office of Management and Finance, Chief Administrator's Office. Um, and you have pretty much summed it up very well. Um, when we were beginning our original planning of the charitable campaign back in March, that's when COVID uh, happened, occurred. Um, and then shortly thereafter, the racial equity movement started in earnest. Uh, and so my office and the chief administrator were trying to find a way to um, address these issues within the context of the campaign to provide aid to those organizations that are on the utmost front lines of COVID and the racial equity movement uh, to try to make a real difference. And um, we discussed it with chiefs of staff uh, and it seemed like the best way was to take the uh, existing campaign, which is more of a broad brush and really focus it in on the issues that are affecting all of us right now, um, especially communities of color uh, and people who are suffering from COVID, family members of people who are taking care of people with COVID, um, and especially where the two meet together, because we know the communities of color are being very, uh, very hardly impact by um, COVID-19. Um, but also we wanted to show some support for the greater movement as well. Um, so we have proposed a pilot program. Uh, we reached out to the Portland Housing Bureau and the Portland Bureau of Emergency Management and the Office of Equity and Human Rights and asked them which organizations were partnering with the city um, because we would like to invite them to participate in the campaign this year. Um, we also know that city employees are facing furloughs and uh, a lot of people are under are having serious financial hardships. So um, we wanted to support them as well by not offering so many choices, kind of narrowing our focus, but also for those folks that don't have the ability to donate. And we know that there are probably uh, quite a few people who would like to participate in some way. We are asking them to share with my office their volunteer efforts and we will highlight them on the campaign's website because whether you give your time or your money, it doesn't matter. You're helping the community and we really care about that this year. So I think that's, are there any questions at this point? Very good, colleagues. Commissioner Hardesty. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yes, uh, didn't get to my my uh, hands up thing fast enough, but you saw me. Um, and so uh, is it your recommendation that this list that you've provided will be the only avenues for city employees to give through the giving campaign this year? This year only. Um, the list is also, it doesn't have to be all inclusive. Um, our, the criteria that we used were, was, were the organizations directly partnering with the city on COVID-19 or the racial equity movement? And these were the organizations that were suggested to us by those three bureaus. If anybody knows of another organization that we've missed, that is actively partnering with the city on those two issues, we would like to include them. Uh, I, I will say that uh, the, uh, the uh, coordination uh, team has a list of 100 plus uh, organizations that are providing direct assistance to community members. 
I okay. don't know if you've had a chance to talk to Mike Myers, but that is a inclusive list of organizations that are volunteer organizations, as well as organizations with paid staff. So have you, it, I, I'm just trying to understand if the list is limited to uh, 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 paid staff groups or are, is it also reflective of volunteer organizations? It looks like most of the organizations, uh, just at a, a glance, are organizations with paid staff people. But my experience has been during COVID, there are a lot of voluntary efforts that are providing significant community support. Um, and again, mm -hmm. one of those lists is available uh, through the Coordination Center. Uh, because uh, it, there's at least a hundred organizations, but many of them you would not know because they don't have paid staff advocating for more money. The the criteria that we used when I when I met or checked with PBEM, and we did receive a great number of those organizations from PBEM. Um, the criteria was: is it a 501c3 organization? Um, as long as it's a 501c3 organization, I don't see any reason why they could not participate as long as they're, uh, you know, an, an actual nonprofit. Um, I didn't look or we didn't look into whether they're mostly volunteer run or staff people. Um, but I can certainly circle back with Mike on that. Um, and so you're because limited we do by want to be inclusive. Uh, thank you, Janet. I just wanted to be clear. You're limited by a 501c3 designation? Yeah. Uh, so that our payroll can give them, uh, can, can make the donations through our employees' payroll. Are you limited by them having a fiscal agent if they don't have a uh, 501c3 themselves? If they have a fiscal agent, somebody who's willing to represent them, we can certainly work with them that way. I just want to make sure that the list is inclusive and not exclusive, uh, and that we're exactly. actually thinking about the people that are providing the on-the-ground assistance right now um, and have been since COVID started. So that that's my, my questions have not, no, I have no problems with anybody on the list. I just wanted to make sure that we were really being thoughtful about who's on the ground providing direct services because some of the voluntary efforts that are taking place, I don't believe those organizations have 501c3s yet, um, but it doesn't mean their work isn't critical to the recovery mm -hmm. of Portland. Thank you. And yeah, and we would like to include them as well. Um, so if there's a way to work with them, we would love to do that. This is, this is super, it's, speaking off the cuff, it's so important. So I, I um, uh, how do we make sure that when we, uh, and I, I support the concept uh, for a one year pilot. So how do we make sure that at the end of the day, we have a list that actually is inclusive of all the work that's taking place to help people stay safe in their communities? And that is a that is a great question. I don't know if it's necessarily from from our perspective possible to know who everybody is, but we can certainly do our due diligence. And um, I can check back with PBAM. I can check with the Office of Equity and Human Rights back again, Portland Housing Bureau. Um, I you know I am more than happy to have people come to me and recommend organizations and reach out to them. So I just had a radical thought. What if we said we were only gonna have organizations serving the community with an annual budget of $100,000 or less or $200,000 or less? And uh, that, I can make you know, I, I, I'm happy to try to make the case for that. Um, because uh, my, my concern continues to be that we have wonderful organizations that serve our community. Some are enormous and some suck up a lot of the city's resources. Some nobody right. knows they exist. 
Um, and so I think if you gave people a list of organizations that represented the big boy and girl organizations, that people tend to look for organizations that they at least know the name. They don't know why they know the name, but they just know mm -hmm. the name. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, and as you know, we have given a lot of resources uh, to a lot of organizations uh, since COVID started. Yeah. I continue to have the concern that the bulk of our resources continue to go to the same big organizations. Um, here's an opportunity for us to really think creatively since this is a pilot and we're on, and we're doing it this year and we'll do some assessment about whether it worked or not. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, and so again, the idea is strong, but I am very concerned that we have we are we are still feeding the same kind of um, um, uh, organizations that we continue to go to because those are the ones that we know whether or not they do good work and many of them do great work. I, that's not my concern. My concern is that um, is that unless we know uh, unless you are tracking how many dollars we're actually sending already to those organizations, then it's really hard not to continue to send them the bulk of the resources we have. Understood. And I am open to any and all suggestions. All right. I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Udaley. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and Thank you for um, coming to us with this today. I am also very supportive of this uh, temporary change in the giving program. And I agree with Commissioner Hardesty. I, I'm, I'm really interested in this conversation. I think there are groups that are not formal nonprofits doing really vital work in our community. And I absolutely understand the challenges of uh, including them in this campaign because mm -hmm. those donations will not be tax deductible. And there's just less assurance of, I guess, certain kind of standards that we would want to make sure exist. Uh, so I'm not going to push for that if, you know, the 501c3s or they have fiscal sponsors, but I am really interested in the conversation about um, focusing the dollars on organizations that have small budgets. Um, as Commissioner Hardesty said, there are large organizations that um, take up a lot of resources. They have fundraising machines. Um, and these smaller organizations have a harder time grant writing and fundraising because they're focused on delivering services. They may not even have a paid grant writer. They're also more nimble, and I'm generalizing here, but they can be more nimble and they can stretch a buck a lot farther. The fewer hands that dollar passes between our check and the person who's receiving the services, the better. So. I mean, I don't want to um, hold up this process in any way, but I do think it's a really valid, important conversation. And as I said, that's I'm 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 open for that. We're open for that. Commissioner Fritz. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Janet, for your long time um, support and, and staffing of this program. You've and I appreciate very much your willingness to rethink it. Um, I'm wondering if there's a way to get at what both Commissioner Udaly and Commissioner Hardesty are asking. I mean, this is an employee giving program. The employees choose where they direct their money, um, and um, they may have heard of a big organization and not of a small one. So with the uh, the beauty of internet where you can post as much as you want on a website, perhaps there could be a link to, you, you could sort the um, organizations in terms of size of budget so that if people want to give to smaller organizations, and in particular, if there's a new, or if there's an organization that, um, well, each of the, each organization could write up their own uh, three sentence spiel about okay. why um, they encourage employees to give to them. Um, and that way the organizations would get some publicity, even if employees choose to go with one that they've always given to or whatever. Okay. So um, that would be my recommendation is to invite those who are on the list to send in something that could be posted with a link um, to their websites even. 
Yes, absolutely. And we definitely can do a list of, I mean, it's the, the information about how much money each organization makes is readily available online. So we can certainly do our own list and put that information out there for employees uh, and then they, they can make their decisions. I assure you daily. Oh, no, okay. Um, so I'll, I'll just chime in on this because it's a really interesting question and it's almost a philosophical question. Um, how big is too big? And should we in fact be supporting success? So if an organization is successful and it grows, uh, are we uh, imposing some sort of an implicit bias against organizations that have proven themselves to be successful and have been able to scale their services and potentially even become more cost effective in their delivery? And I would caution us against uh, presuming that large or established is necessarily a bad thing. On the other hand, there are uh, amongst our newer startups, our uh, fresher startups, are a lot of those that are engaged in uh, addressing the needs of the BIPOC community, recent immigrants, folks who've been underserved, and they're looking at things in new, new and unique ways. Um, but on the other hand, I, I think we still have a threshold of success. This is something our children's levy has been struggling with for a long time. And we spent about a year and a half going through a significant process to figure out how do we address this question of newer, smaller organizations, nonprofits in the community, some of which still need technical assistance and support to really be successful. And ultimately the decision was made to create a completely separate sleeve of funding for those organizations and they would be evaluated based on slightly different standards that reflect the fact that number one, they reach communities that some of the mainline organizations have not been able to successfully reach. And on the other hand, acknowledging some of those organizations are gonna need additional handholding and technical support to be able to comply with the rules of the children's levy itself. So um, that's, that's a model certainly worth looking at I applaud the efforts here. Uh, Janet, I appreciate your openness to uh, suggestions and ideas uh, from commissioners and others who, who might want to put an idea on the table. I, I, I think you're finding the right way forward on behalf of all of us. So uh, thank you for that. Um, and, and I also just have sort of a, a plea to the community. Portland has a lot of nonprofit organizations. Like we have a lot. And there is a tremendous amount of duplication in certain service areas. And that's a hard message for people to hear sometimes when, when they, they've really got their heart in the right place and they're enthusiastic and they want to dedicate time and energy to a cause. Uh, sometimes it is better to see if there's not already an organization out there doing some of this work or maybe their work could be expanded and administrative overhead and staff costs could be shared rather than starting a completely new 501c3 organization that then becomes a competitor for resources, has its own overhead, its own staff costs, and uh, competes, frankly, for limited government resources. So uh, I, I would encourage all of us to take a bigger picture look at the nonprofit sector in our community and how we can support it and engage it, but also have frank and realistic conversation about what is needed in the community and maybe what becomes duplicative in the community. Um, do we have any public testimony on this item? Mayor. Oh, Commissioner Udaley, I'm sorry. I wanted to jump back in real quick. Yeah, of course. Thank you everyone for this conversation. So Janet, I'm curious if we pass this today, what's our opportunity to return to this conversation? about crafting the list or, or is there one? I would say it's open. The, okay. the, the hard stop that we end up having is when we get closer, we're, we're thinking that the campaign will be in November. So um, there is some back end work that needs to be done by loading these organizations into the online donation um, portal. And also um, those organizations that don't have um, uh, haven't been with the city yet. The Bureau of Human Resources would need to um, do some setup on their end. So it, it's important that at some point we 
kind of draw the line, but I don't think we're there yet. And um, so sometime this month, maybe. Oh, like, yeah. Could we have Ab- 30 days. To, sure. Because I do think everyone's made really good points. I think it's important to bear in mind that the majority of nonprofits, even the big ones, are taking a hit to donations right now. Their yeah. revenue is down anywhere from 20 to 40 percent. But my but in uh, in our efforts to deliver equitable aid to the community through this program with a new focus on BIPOC organizations, it it's really interesting to then take that conversation even further into equitable distribution of, of our dollars. Um, and my my preference really is BIPOC-led organizations and um, people with lived experience, if we're talking about an organization that serves the homeless population, for instance. So um, I, I just, I would love to be able to continue it. And I'm glad to hear there's an opportunity for us to um, give you our recommendations. I do think it's a great opportunity for the city to highlight a lot of smaller, um, newer organizations that are relatively unknown to the public. Yeah. Um, but there may be bigger organizations on this list who have really great outcomes and we know, um, you know, have existing infrastructure and connections in the community that we might want to support. But um, yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that the I, I think that the city employees would agree with you on that. Um, it's hard to tell who is going to donate where, um, but it is important uh, to to be doing our homework and to be providing them with the best options that we can. Very good, so, Commissioner yeah. Hardesty. Thank you. If I may, uh, Janet, uh, it's funny because uh, my. I was trying to think, was this my very first job in Portland? Yes, it was. My very first job in Portland was with the Black United Fund of Portland. And that job actually um, allowed me to go to various workplaces and encourage those employees to think outside of the limited United Way box that every employer was thinking in at that time um, and encourage people to give to an organization like the Black United Fund, which wasn't as well known or wasn't as known as uh, United Way as an example. Um, and I, uh, last year, it really struck me when you came and did your presentation, how many organizations now <laughs> Um, had the opportunity to receive resources from city employees. Um, and so but what I know is if we don't start putting in front of city employees organizations that they may not be aware of or accustomed to, the, uh, those um, our employees will never have the opportunity to invest in those organizations. And so that is my personal lived experience with uh, workplace giving campaigns. I traveled the state of Oregon uh, providing presentations and opening up workplaces so that organizations led by people of color had an opportunity equal to the same opportunity United Way had. Uh, so here we are, uh, 30 plus, or somebody's baby, I think. Um, That's my son. <laughs> That's your son, ah, okay. Yeah, he's... I, I, I'm so impressed with parents who are able to keep their their face straight when their kids are <laughs> going crazy in the background. Uh, <laughs> um, but I, I, I wanted to tell you that because I think we also are now at a milestone. That was 30 years ago. We are at a milestone today uh, at really fundamentally rethinking a lot of things we thought we had the answer to. And so I just want to encourage that uh, Yes, I, I appreciate the creativity, uh, but I think we could do better. And I look forward to working with you over the next 30 days to make sure that we create those opportunities to invest in things that we know are making our community better and are helping us to build towards the equitable future that we're looking for. So uh, just wanted you to know, I, I, I have a long history with our workplace giving campaigns. And uh, so thank you. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Is there uh, any further discussion on this item? Carla, we have a, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna ask if there's testimony. 
Yes, we have one person, Edith Gillis. Hi, Edith. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Go ahead. Um, so I wanted to, before we even get timed, I have a question for Carla. I had thought I'd register to give public commentary on 688, 690, 694, 695, 702, 703, and 704. And um, I wasn't included in those earlier ones. And I'm wondering um, how to correct that from happening in today's meeting for the rest of the stuff. And, and if you could email me or tell me how to avoid uh, these problems in the future. And if that same problem happened for me multiple times, um, it might be happening for other people. Yeah. Edith, we haven't gotten to 688 or 690. So we're okay. we're on, um, yeah, 694, you're 695, and I have you for 702 as well. Okay, I'm ready to start. Okay. Um, I was going to bring up many of the comments that Commissioner Hardesty said, and I'm so grateful for that, and Commissioner Udaley. Um, I wanted to say that um, I would like the city to have a consistent pattern that would be publicly available as, as well as to the employees using a same framework so that um, we're not expanding the gap between the haves and the have nots, those that can afford um, or that have volunteers who can provide incredible PR and outreach and uh, websites versus those that are putting their money directly into services and don't have that. So if the city would have available not only to its employees for their giving program, and I thank you so much for also including volunteer work because that is priceless. Um, if we could also have that posted for the public to see where you uh, would be um, having like a grid showing the categories of services and community members that are served, um, whether it's QT, BIPOC, immigrant, uh, impoverished, houseless, who are also on the, um, the management, the administration, you know, um, the, the leadership, and, um, and also other ways in which people can process cross check that see the the different ways of services so if it's a generic phrase and a framework for everybody to see um we can uh let people know about good things that are happening they're not going to re reproduce the wheel uh we're not going to have the bigger gap between the have and the have nots we're going to support what we want to have and we're going to be wasting less money on the publicity um, and we're going to have more accountability. Another good advantage of this is that the city has accomplished a lot of really great things already in today's uh, meeting, and the public doesn't know that. The public knows of the horrible things that police are doing, and so the city is losing credibility and cooperation, and therefore authority and power and sustainability. But when you let people see these good things that the city is doing, um, it can help us have more of a sense of trust and uh, cooperation, um, we can have more resilience, we can have better um, efficiency of our resources, and we're gonna have a better way to counteract the, the despair, the cynicism, the resentment and anger that is, that's been coming up because of, of the incredible criminality violence um, by the police. And so I'm really wanting to commend you for doing this, for being flexible, for being thoughtful, um, and just expand on the good work that you're doing. And again, thank you for the comments that Commissioner Hardesty and you daily said that I was going to say myself. Very good. Thank you. Carla, does that complete public testimony? That does, Mayor. Please call the roll. Hardesty. Uh, uh, thank you so much for this conversation. Um, I. Um, this vote today says that I am supportive in concept, but I expect that we're going to kind of make some changes as we move forward. Uh, that is on the public record, so I'm going to assume that that is so. Um, and um, and I want to say uh, uh, I want to uh, support what Edith just said. Um, thank you for thinking outside the box during this time and in this environment and understanding that the world has actually shifted on its axle and uh, we will be doing things a lot different. So I am happy to vote aye, and I offer my assistance to help make this the best uh, workplace giving campaign we could possibly have. You daily. 
Well, thank you again for the presentation and thank you everyone for the conversation. I think it's uh, interesting and important. Like Commissioner Hardesty, I support the direction that this is going. We are going to be putting our money where our mouth is and that always feels good because there's always more talk, I think, at City Hall than there is WAC, so I'm grateful for that. Uh, and I'm also happy to give any additional input into developing that list. As the co-founder of a nonprofit that was entirely volunteer for the first couple of years and continues uh, after 20 plus years to this day operating in a shoestring budget, I want to admit I might be a little biased towards small organizations because I know I just know what what they can do with limited yeah. dollars. Um, I vote aye. Fritz. Thank you, Janet Senior, for all your work on this. Um, I, I want to echo what the mayor said in terms of we shouldn't be pen penalizing organizations that are successful. And I'm thinking in particular of the Black Resilience Fund, which is a brand new startup and has raised over one and a half million dollars since George, George Floyd was murdered and puts it directly into um, helping people out. So I wouldn't want us to limit um, uh, just based on dollar amount, because, um, you know, it, that way we would perhaps, or you would, since I won't be here next year, but you might price out the, the ones that are most successful this year. Um, so I, I do think that the approach of, of sharing information, and let's just re return the focus. This is city employees giving their own money um, and choosing where to, to do it, and then the, but the city making it easy for them to do that. And so I very much appreciate um, all of the public service that our employees give, including um, making financial contributions as well as the work they do. Thank you for your work. Aye. Wheeler. Thanks. This is great. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Next up, 695. Pay settlement of the estate of Lane Martin's wrongful death lawsuit in the sum of $975,000 involving the Portland Police Bureau. Colleagues, on the afternoon of July 30th, 2019, Portland Police were called to Northeast 122nd Avenue in Northeast Davis because Lane Martin was threatening people in a parking lot with a knife and a hatchet. Multiple officers attempted to communicate with Mr. Martin to de-escalate the situation, but Mr. Martin was unwilling or unable to follow their commands to drop his weapons. According to reports, Mr. Martin was acting erratically, screaming threats to people on the sidewalk, in the street, and claiming to be a federal officer. After being shot with less lethal ammunition rounds, Mr. Martin ran into an apartment complex courtyard on Southeast Ash Street. There he faced off with a group of officers and was shot and killed when he reached into his pocket to grab a knife. In mediation sessions in late June, the estate of Lane Martin agreed to dismiss all claims in exchange for $975,000. Risk management and the city attorney's office recommend that the city council approve the settlement to resolve this case. We have Randy Stenquist from the risk management division and city attorney's representatives to answer any questions. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor. Randy Stenquist, city risk management. Um, you've stolen my thunder. You've read basically the synopsis of the case. Uh, all of the commissioners and, and you were briefed uh, on the more details of the case back in a memo from, from risk in August. Um, so Mr. Bailey and I are here to answer questions that you might have about this negotiated settlement that was a voluntary uh, mediation participation by all of the parties. Uh, and this was the amount of money that all of the parties agreed to. Very good. Any further questions, colleagues? Carla, any public testimony on this item? Yes, Mayor, we have three people signed up. Very good. The first person is Edith Gillis. Hi, Edith. I'm sorry. Um, I agree with the former city employer um, and attorney Becky Chow, that there is a high risk of a jury finding the city guilty and requiring a much higher payment. Um, 
I want us, as I say almost every time we have these, that really address the underlying reason why we keep having these payouts that are too little for the um, wounded parties, um, injured parties, and too much for us to take out of our tax dollars. Um, and so I would like us to really commit, um, as Commissioner Fritz has said that she wants us to be doing, and Hardesty and you daily that um, we apply research-based best practices for preventing or reducing lawsuits and reducing or preventing fines um, and other kinds of payments. And one, have good laws and policy, uh, which are inclusive in developing this from the community members. Uh, we can make a lot better improvements of that. I know you're also trying to work on the city charter. I commend that and on the uh, police contract. Two, have good communication and public education. Three, good supervision and oversight. Four, clear um, rules with transparency um, and accessibility to all members. Uh, five, good lifetime correction enforcement uh, with realistic and effective consequences um, immediately. Uh, good training support for improvements for each party good empathetic listening and rapport building, earning the trust and community building, uh, sincere apology and accountability with restorative justice, um, and ways to learn on how to go forward with it in a regenerative culture. Um, for example, uh, doctors are not gonna be sued, even the horrendous things, if they are immediately apologetic and make things right and are treating people decently. And people are often sued, uh, who may not have done as, as comparative harm, but they are so contemptible and they're so oppositional, um, like in a war, um, the old legal lawyer mentality is not what we need to have for a, a strong, healthy city. We all know we need to improve what the police are doing. And, um, and we all know that the police lie, that they uh, falsify evidence, destroy evidence, tamper with witnesses, and um, the story that you're saying is not, you're acting as if that were fact, and that's not agreed upon fact, and it's not what's represented by the evidence um, and the witnesses of the scene. So we need to make sure that this sort of thing doesn't happen again, and that we don't even have public statements, as you were just reading, that are untrue and that are going to um, increase things. I, I would recommend that after every time that there is a use of force, especially if there's police killing someone. That's three minutes. That you immediately have Thank within you. a week Who's a public next? hearing. Next is Dan Handelman. Mr. Handelman, welcome. Hi. Hi, um, good morning. This is Dan Handelman from Portland Cop Watch. Can you all hear me? Hello? Yes, yes we can. can hear you, Dan. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, it's hard to tell when you're on the phone. All right. Um, again, this is Dan Handelman. Uh, the city is settling this lawsuit today. It's listed as a wrongful death lawsuit for Lane Martin. Uh, and as noted, he is, was clearly a mental health crisis. He had been swinging an axe around while walking down the street. But after the officer shot him with a left lethal round, he dropped that ax. That was not mentioned in the mayor's narrative. Um, shooting uh, Mr. Martin was not a form of de-escalation. Um, the officer cornered him in that apartment complex, and then the off shooter officer and one other officer said he pulled a knife. But um, conveniently, Mr. Martin did not live to give his side of the story. This was the fourth of five shooting deaths last year, and at least the third involving someone with mental health issues. Uh, we previously analyzed the shootings reviewed by the OIR group, splitting them from the pre-DOJ agreement in 2012 to post-DOJ. Since the last report ended with a May 2017 case, we added the 18 incidents that happened since then, including at least 10 people with mental health issues. We found that while 55% of the cases OIR were reviewed pre-DOJ involved mental health, the ones since then make up 60% of shootings. So the fruit of seven years of revising police policies and training to use less force on people in mental health crisis is more deaths of, and more shootings and deaths of people in mental health crisis. In terms of taxpayer dollars, the settlement falling just shy of the $1 million mark means all this comes from taxpayer pockets and not from an outside insurance firm. We recently updated our data 
on settlements and jury awards and start, found that since 1992, Portland's paid out under just under $12 million for the top 25 misconduct cases, with the death of Mr. Martin coming in at number four. It's notable that number three is Aaron Campbell's death, number 10 is James Jahar Perez's, and number 14 went to Bruce Brown, a black man who in 2001 was mistaken for a perpetrator and wounded by Kenneth Duilio, the officer who headed up the gun violence reduction team until it was disbanded. Number 24 is Gerald Grattan, who was shot in the back but lived, who was also African-American. This shows that in addition to failures to help people in crisis, the PPB has a history of wrongfully shooting African-Americans, but there's still no justice for Keaton Otis. The police review board cleared all these officers in this case per the report that came out in August. There was praise for the officers' efforts to de-escalate, but no acknowledgement that backing off is one means to de-escalate. And it's likely the ongoing confrontational stance that led to Mr. Martin's death. Uh, we read Mayor Weir's claim that he can't comment on cases because he ultimately has to decide whether officers are in or out of policy, but we're not asking city council to say anything to pre jeopardize the settlement. We want to hear promises that policy, training, and tactics will change to end the parade of deadly force. And I would also like to hear the word tragedy mentioned when we talk about what happened to Mr. Martin. We understand that his family wants to put this incident behind them. It's a reasonable position. We've heard it from many, many families. However, we hope they will consider helping to push the city to change the way police do their business so we don't end up with more tragedy like their sons. Uh, I'm always worried say, of saying things like this out loud, but we're now nine months into the year, and so far the Portland police have not wounded or killed anyone using a firearm that they did shoot at the man who was squatting in a home and missed him in June. There have been at least 20 shootings in the state so far this year. It's a welcome relief that only one was by the PPB. The only year we have on record with only one deadly force incident by PPB is 2009. That's we hope three this minutes. Will be the second one. Thank you. Thank you. And the last person who signed up is Shannon Kramer. Welcome, Shannon. Can you hear me, everyone? Yep, loud and clear. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, hello, my name is Shannon, and I have lived in Portland on and off now for over a decade. Like Lane Martin, I am a Portland State University student in my 30s. I'm here because of the egregious use of deadly force by Portland police and that it is part of a repeated pattern of excessive force we've seen for almost a decade. A pattern that has cost us and will cost us millions if not billions as my previous two testimony um, uh, civilians, whatever you wanna call them, Edith and uh, Don have said. Um, it's also shown Yet again, not only in those patterns Don mentioned, but also in the yet to see justice case of Kwanis Hayes and demonstrated over and over and over again in the last 100 nights, night after night by the Portland police. Just last night, footage of police making an arrest surface where an officer removes the face mask of an arrestee during a pandemic with tear gas in order to mace the pinned person directly in the face. This is an example of wanton cruelty to a person well within the control of the officers pinning him and an example yet again of a potential lawsuit that will cost us Portland residents millions. Our police on the ground have been duped into betraying their own citizens, duped by a brotherhood so disconnected from reality it pits Americans against one another, a brotherhood that literally escorts white supremacists into the city limits, and that responds with brutal force to the largely peaceful Black Lives Matter protesters. A recent study covered in Time noted that 93% of these protests have been peaceful, and yet the police respond disproportionately, violently, every time to Black Lives Matter protesters when compared to other protests. Our officers on the front lines have been set up to fail by their superiors. They've been told they must act with violence and dominance, concerned only with power, optics, and budget. This expectation of violence and the enabling of excessive force leaves no room for compassion and costs Portlanders their lives, their well-being, and our finances. It sets Portlanders up to keep paying out to families in wrongful death suits, in suits about tear gas, and to keep seeing racist and brutal practices that not only persist, but are elevated as if they were part and parcel of police duties, which they are not. I know this will fall on deaf ears to the Portland police. Their chief and their higher ups will defensively rally together as they have night after night, like children afraid to admit that they have done wrong, indignant instead of dignified, petulant instead of powerful, but our people deserve better. The integrity of our institutions has failed, as has any Christian value our brethren hold dear, any universal value or moral code for those held to a higher standard has been laid bare as a farce but we do not need to stay here. They can be better and they should be better. And it is up to you to ensure that actual actionable change occurs or else you are wasting our time and you are wasting our money. So I thank you for your time and I hope you consider the broader implications of your inaction regarding the pattern of force so clearly prevalent within the Portland Police Bureau. Thank you. Thank you for your perspective. Carla, does that complete public testimony? That does, Mayor. Very good, call the roll. 
Hardesty? My heart goes out to the family. Uh, I vote aye. You daily. Aye. Fritz. As Dan Handelman noted, um, there is a very disparate impact on people affected by mental illness. And um, beyond what we do, uh, what Commissioner Hardesty is doing with the street response, um, supported by the mayor and the council, we do need to um, continue to put pressure on the legislature to adequately fund mental health services within the community, because um, people shouldn't should have the resources that they need to not get into such crisis whenever that can be prevented. And I, I um, agree that this, this was a tragedy and um, I vote aye. Wheeler. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Next item is 696. Authorize sewer revenue bonds to finance sewer system capital improvements in an amount not to exceed $350 million and to refund outstanding bonds. Colleagues, this legislation authorizes the issuance of bonds secured by the net revenues of the city's sewer system that are sufficient to provide proceeds of up to $350 million to finance capital assets of the sewer system, including amounts that are reasonably required to finance related costs. The ordinance is intended to authorize bonds that are expected to be issued in fiscal year 2021 and fiscal year 21-22. While approximately $140 million of bonds are expected to be issued in the current fiscal year, a higher amount may be issued to fund project needs if there's a financial benefit in doing so based on market conditions at the time of the sale. Mike Garak is here to answer any questions. Welcome, My, how are you doing? It's Matt, sorry, I said Mike, I think, sorry. I know it's Matt. Yeah, it's okay, thank you. Thank you. How are you doing? <laughs> uh, I'm doing okay, I'm doing okay. Glad to hear. Um, <laughs> good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. For the record, I'm Matt Gearock, Debt Manager with the Bureau of Revenue and Financial Services. This ordinance, uh, as the Mayor noted, uh, authorizes the city to issue up to 350 million of sewer system revenue bonds to finance various projects under the Bureau of Environmental Services Capital Improvement Plan. The 350 million uh, borrowing authorization is expected to cover approximately the next two years of the Bureau's finance capital expenditures. Of the total borrowing author authorization, the Bureau currently anticipates issuing approximately Matt, 150 I'm sorry million revenue bonds. Matt, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Jonas, do you have your hand up for re Okay, no, never mind. Good. Sorry, you're good to go, Matt. Okay. Um, the 150 to 200 million of revenue bonds uh, this fiscal year to cover capital expenditures for the next 12 months. Uh, however, given the recent uncertainty around market access in the municipal bond market during COVID-19, the city's debt management division will be assessing the market for opportune conditions to potentially issue the entire amount in order to lock in advantageous long-term interest rates. Based on today's market conditions, the estimated borrowing rate is approximately 2.15% for the 20-year borrowing, though this will vary depending on market events that occur between now and the bond sale. Over the next two months, the city's debt management division and the Bureau of Environmental Services will be preparing the documentation for facilitating the bond sale, which is expected to occur in early November of 2020. I'm happy to answer any questions on the financing. And I'm also joined by Jonas Beery from BES for any Bureau specific questions. Very good, colleagues, any questions? Uh, doesn't look like it right at this particular point. Uh, do we have any public testimony on this item? No one registered, Mayor. All right, good. Uh, then without further ado, thank you for the presentation. This is the first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It was the second reading. Thanks for the great work. Next item, 697, Portland Parks. Approve findings to authorize an exemption to the competitive bidding requirements authorize a competitive solicitation for the use of the alternative contracting method of negotiated request for proposals and authorize the chief procurement officer to execute a contract with the successful proposer upon acceptance by the council of the procurement report for the Mount Tabor Yard Maintenance 
facility and multimodal pathway project for an estimated $8,100,000. Colleagues, voters overwhelmingly approved the parks replacement bond back in 2014. Thanks in no small part to the work of Commissioner Amanda Fritz and Commissioner Nick Fish. In total, the bond funded over 50 projects across Portland, including playground replacements, improving swimming pools, fixing trails, bridges, and many other things. And we're now nearing the home stretch. This is actually one of the very last bond projects to begin construction. And this one's focused on our Portland Park and Recreation employees who work for the Mount Tabor Yard facility. This project will provide a safer work environment for our staff. It'll improve productivity with a brand new maintenance shop, which has been desperately needed for a long time. It will add connectivity to Mount Tabor Park via a new multimodal pathway and more. The proposed alternative contracting method will ensure the contractor understands and can help respond to the site's unique constraints add flexibility in construction scheduling to ensure that the city employees can continue their important work and improve outcomes for our minority contracting goals and more. Here to share more details about the project and the proposed alternative contracting method are Robin Laughlin, who's the Capital Project Manager at Parks, and our Chief Procurement Officer, Lester Spittler. Welcome, Robin and Lester. Uh, thank you, Mayor Wheeler. I um, want to give you guys a heads up before I get started. I'm, the wind just picked up like five minutes ago, so my internet's popping in and out, but I do have you guys on the phone for backup. So if you lose my video, Lester will back up and continue the slideshow for me. Thank you. But fingers crossed that we, we don't have wind for 10 more minutes. Oops. And I need to share screen. Screen one. Can you see the first slide now, please? Not yet. Are you there now? Still not seeing the slide. Keelan, can you help us with this? How, how can we get Robin access to uh, her desk? Yeah, sure. I can, I can share my screen, Robin, if you would prefer. Um, uh oh. She may be losing connection. I, I could share my screen too. Yeah, Ro Lester, why don't you go ahead and continue? And then if Robin comes back, uh, great. Sure thing. All right. Can you see the presentation? Yeah, we can see it. You're good to go. Okay, Robin, are you there via the phone? Uh, let me, I'll just go ahead and pinch it here um, and walk through the presentation and talking points. So thank you, um, Mayor Wheeler, City Council. I'm Lester Spittler, the City's Chief Procurement Officer. I'm here with Robin to present on the Mount Tabor Yard Maintenance Facility and Multimodal Pathway Project and to recommend, that, recommend authorization of the alternative contracting method of a negotiated request for proposal. All right, so next. All right, so sorry about that. Um, the Mount Tabor Yard project is part of the 2014 Parks Bond Replacement Program that was generously passed by voters approving the 68 million bond measures to address critical park needs in seven priority areas. This project fits into the protecting workers focus area and will renovate the outmoded aging structures at the Mount Tabor Maintenance Yard facility. This is the second of two replacement bond projects to go into construction to protect workers. The project is located immediately south of Mount Tabor Park in Southeast Portland within the Mount Tabor Neighborhood Association. The project site shown here in color fronts Southeast Division Street, Southeast 64th Avenue and Southeast Lincoln Street. The project site is an essential facility from which Portland Parks and Recreation maintenance and operations staff service the assets of the citywide park system. The Mount Tabor Yard facility is the primary work location of 110 employees from several 
parks and recreation divisions with staff responsible for horticultural services, aquatics, turf, and irrigation, carpentry, welding, painting, the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing trades, and facility maintenance technicians. The project will provide a modern, safe facility for many of these workers, replacing some of the aging structures you see on the screen. The community has had a significant role in the future of Mount Tabor Park, as well as the project specific portions of the park at the maintenance yard and at the long block fronting Lincoln Avenue. In 2008, Council adopted the Mount Tabor Master Plan update, which amended the Mount Tabor Master Plan to include the project area at the maintenance yard. This was the culmination of a year long planning process in partnership with the Mount Tabor and South Tabor neighborhoods and the 35 member planning group. For this specific project, a project advisory committee was engaged throughout the project via regular meetings and the general public was engaged through public open house meetings. Both inputs influenced the site development plans. Additional communications to the public were made through updates to the project website. The current work was approved through a type three land use process for conditional use review and historical resource review. Public hearings were held before the hearings officer and the Landmarks Commission. This work was completed in, in May of 2018. With input and support from the community and the staff at the yard, Portland Parks and Recreation developed a final design that will construct key improvements focusing on a new 17,822 square foot staff maintenance shop facility as shown in the long black rectangle on the screen, removal and relocation of horticultural greenhouses and outdoor plant storage areas to the area shown in yellow, establishment of a horticultural plant storage area adjacent to Southeast Lincoln and Southeast 64 Avenue as shown in the center of the green area, a maintenance yard reconfiguration upgrades within the area shown in gray on the screen. A new multimodal pathway shown here in light orange is funded by systems development charges. The new path will stretch from Southeast Division Street to the park entry at Lincoln Avenue and will provide off street connections for pedestrians and bicyclists, as well as half street improvements to Southeast 64th Avenue. Public art will be located along the pathway as well. The new staff maintenance shop facility to be built with this project will include shop space for carpentry, plumbing, and electrical trades and facility maintenance technicians, as well as a crew room, supervisor spaces, and locker facilities. The multimodal path is located along the western edge of the project site. The work associated with this includes a new 12 foot wide concrete path, lighting, and half street improvements along Southeast 64 Ave 64th Avenue leading into the park. The project includes funding from multiple sources. The 2014 Parks Replacement Bond provides 7.6 million and major maintenance funds provide 489,000 for the worker facilities portion of the project. Service, to sell, service development charges in the amount of 1.9 million fund the multimodal path. Portland Parks and Recreation has an anticipated ongoing annual operations and maintenance costs associated with this renovation in the amount of $45,857. These funds were requested and approved in the FY 2021 budget, but withheld until July 2021 due to construction timing. After today's milestone with your approval, we aim to post the request for proposals next month. Construction is estimated to begin early in 2021 and last about 18 months. The project should be substantially complete by summer 2022. And now I will talk about the um, alternative contracting approach. Um, the city is required to address findings um, when we're doing anything other than a low bid for a construction project. So for this project, we, we looked at the low bid approach, um, but since the project was already fully designed and there was a lot of complexities involved, we landed on a negotiated RFP as being the best Procurement method to contract for the project. Some benefits of a negotiated RFP are simply the fact that you get to evaluate proposals and things other than price, like project approach, the team that they assemble, their proposed workforce diversity commitments, and the subcontracting plan. The exemption process requires that the city address 14 findings and publish those findings two weeks prior to a council hearing. The findings were addressed and were posted as required and are included in the council package you have today. The following are a few highlighted findings that support the use of a negotiated RFP on this project. One of them is the fact that an alternative to a low bid cannot diminish competition. So in this, we don't expect diminished competition. In fact, we actually expect more because of the complexities. We feel that it would be a bit risky for a contractor to just come in and submit a low bid. 
We also feel like uh, this approach will facilitate cost savings due to reducing risk of delay claims because we'll be able to look at their schedule as a uh, evaluation criteria. We also feel like there's plenty of public benefits, including increased opportunities for certified subcontractor participation in workforce diversity by asking proposers to tell us how they're going to engage certified subcontractors for, for scopes of work and what sort of commitments they're gonna to make to women and people of color in the various trades that they employ as well as our subcontractors employ, we'll be able to take those things into, uh, into consideration in the contractor who we select. Uh, we also, this as, as, as uh, I mentioned earlier in the presentation, this is a ongoing operations and maintenance facility. So there has to be minimal uh, disruption to that operation. So we'll be able to evaluate things like uh, sequencing of work, of scopes of work, constructability reviews, um, their schedule, and any sort of uh, you know ideas that they bring to the table on how to on how to execute this project. Um, and you know, lastly, we'll be able to ensure that all bidding contractors fully understand the requirements of the site and scope of work uh, to the best of their ability and understand the values of the city. So uh, there have been, there's been park staff and, and staff from procurement services that have presented over the past um, probably nine months at, at various organizations that represent minority contractors. We've presented this project along with other forecasted projects that the city has had. So by doing so, we've, we've hoped to gain some, some interest and um, some eagerness on behalf of those contractors who, who would either want to respond as prime contractors or subcontractors. Uh, we will be working collectively with, with Robin and, and staff from Parks to include questions asking for commitments to certified subcontractor participation as well as workforce development for women and, and people of color and apprentices and the trades. Um, and lastly, pricing will not be the sole criteria. We will be disaggregating and focusing the pricing on scopes of work versus a, uh, a lump sum amount for the entirety of the project. That gives us more uh, insight into how the contractor is pricing certain scopes out that along with what their proposed schedule uh, is will allow us to to pick the, the best contractor that aligns themselves with the city's values and understands the goals of the project. So with that, that concludes our presentation. Uh, our recommendation to Council is to accept the findings and authorize the project's exemption from the competitive low. Very very good, thank you. Does that, does that complete the entirety? And if so, we'll get to Commissioner Hardesty first then. Uh, Commissioner Hardesty, you're up first. And Commissioner Fritz. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, and thank you, Lester. And um, I, I don't know if the other person who was attempting to help us actually came back yet, but uh, thank you uh, for that presentation. Um, Lester, I, my, my, my focus question today is, um, it, what I heard you say is we're going to ask the contractors how they're going to meet the goal. What I didn't hear is whether the contract will actually require them to meet the goals that are set for minority and women owned firms participation. Sure, I can answer that. So with a request for proposal, uh, it is a requirement. And so we take their proposal the, the winning contractor's proposal, we incorporate that into the contract. So then that becomes a, a binding uh, contractual requirement. And so it is it is a more powerful, we have more authority in an RFP versus in a low bid uh, because we get to have that evaluative uh, decision-making opportunity. So what happens if six months into it, it, they're not meeting the goal? Well, then, you know, there's, I mean, if they're not meeting what they told us they would do, then, you know, there's liquidated damages. There's ultimately, um, you know, that, that would be considered potentially a breach of contract. There's termination for convenience. Uh, but I think first we would, we would, you know, look to assess liquidated damages. We would, you know, give them a, a cure notice, which says, look, you're not doing what you said you would do. You won the contract based on your proposal. Um, you need to either come up with a corrective action plan, and if you don't, you know, these are the consequences that you'll have. And how closely are you monitoring and tracking this contract for the outcomes that we're looking for? So this con they would the contractor would be reporting in our two software systems, so we would have information, you know, up to date as soon as we're paying the contractor, it tracks the contractor's payments to subs, and then we have the ability to report on that. So, I mean, anywhere from 15, you know, 
it's real time, but you know, it's, there's a delay of about 15 days just because it requires the verification of payments, which tracks the progress of the, the project in our system. And um, can we ask for higher goals than goals that we would ask for a, typically in an RFP? Yeah, so in a in an invitation to bid, you know, our, our standard 20% applies. So, but an RFP, you know, there is really no ceiling. Um, you know, we ask contractors to be creative, to to think big, and ultimately the, the biggest thinkers and the you know the contractors that put a thoughtful proposal will get more points and ultimately they'll they'll have a, a better chance of winning. So um, and oftentimes I think in RFPs we do see higher proposed amounts because they know that they'll be able to work with the city. Um, you know, one thing in a low bid, the, su the subcontracted scopes are really already bought out because they do all that bidding before they submit a bid to us. But in an RFP, you know, they have a plan and then they have an opportunity to look at the various scopes that they're going to subcontract for and think about the best ways to engage subcontractors. And oftentimes that can mean uh, direct negotiations with firms that can mean limiting the pool of competition to certified firms that can mean, you know, doing best value, just like we're doing, or ultimately just doing a, you know, a low priced bid for a, a subcontract scope of work, but there's more creativity and flexibility on behalf of the prime contractor to be able to truly engage thoughtfully and intentionally uh, to get better outcomes than in a low bid. And how do, how, I, I think you just answered that question. Thank you. I'm, I, that's all my questions. Thank you. Commissioner Fritz. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for acknowledging the 2014 bond measure um, that Commissioner and I um, helped to pass. And um, thanks very much to all the park staff who've implemented so many of the projects. I believe this one is one of the last ones, and it's significant that it's one that um, provides improvements for employee um, works, workspaces as well as multimodal paths. So somebody asked me why is why does the path cost eight million? And the answer is because it's not just the path; it's the entire facility. And um, the, the current facility was actually part of the posters for passing the. 2014 bond measure because it's in absolutely horrible state. And I want to thank all of the employees who have um, continued to work there just despite its conditions. Uh, actually, talking of which, I'm looking outside at the smoke and the wind, and I'm just very, very grateful to all of the um, first responders and others who are addressing the horrendous dis um, conditions that we have outside now. And um, thanks to our other presenter who's, whose power went off. I'm, I'm, this is really continuing to be an extremely challenging time. So thanks to everybody who's doing that. So I, I don't um, have a question. I just wanted to thank the staff at Parks and at the Procurement Services. I definitely support this approach, which has resulted in better outcomes for um, women and minorities um, participating in the contract. I also thank the Mount Tabor Neighborhood Association for their participation in figuring out how this path is going to be constructed, as, as well as the configuration of the, the buildings. And so it's really an example of a collaborative effort from a lot of parties and I'm looking forward to seeing the, the completion of this one of the final projects of the bond measure. Hopefully we'll soon have resources for parks to be able to continue to be making really vital improvements as well as maintain them. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Commissioner Fritz. Any further uh, questions at this moment? Very good. Carla, do we have public testimony on this item? No one signed up for this item, Mayor. All right, very good. This is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Thank you very much for the presentation. We appreciate it. 698. Um, excuse me. I'm sorry. Me, yeah, go ahead. Oh, Robin. Oh, back. Hey, Robin. Good to see you back. Hello. I finally patched in with my phone. I can see you on my computer and I can hear you on my phone. So uh, thank you. I just want to say, interrupt and say thank you for your time and your patience with my um, power issues here. And thank you so much, Lester, for covering for me. Um, if anybody has any other questions for me, I'm happy to answer about the project. Thank, thank you, Robin. And Lester, Lester did a very able job filling in and we certainly all understand the technology issues. We spent the first 15 minutes of the meeting trying to sort them out. Commissioner Fritz. Yeah. <laughs> Commissioner Fritz, you remuted accidentally. 
speaking. Well, I got the speech started and I'll just start again then. Thank you. Robin, I'm glad you came back on and that your power was restored because um, you have been absolutely crucial to the success of the bond measure projects in so many of them. And I so so very much appreciate you and your team's uh, work on this and all the other projects. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, everyone. Next item, please, Carla, is 698, Portland Housing Bureau. Authorize an intergovernmental agreement with the city of Gresham for $1,184,642 for the Home Investment Partnership Program. Colleagues, the city of Portland, the city of Gresham have entered into the Home Consortium IGA to implement the activities under the HUD's Home Investment Partnership Program. The city of Portland is the representative member of the Portland Home Consortium and with responsibility to carry out overall responsibility of the Portland Home Consortium. The purpose of this particular intergovernmental agreement is to describe the responsibilities of the parties and specify how the city of Gresham will allocate its Portland Home Consortium grant award for the fiscal year 2021. Welcome, I believe we have Stella Martinez is here. Recording. Stella Martinez, thank you, Mayor. Martinez, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Are there any questions regarding the IGA? It seems like a necessary step. So um, I, I don't have any colleagues, any questions at this point. Carla, is there any public testimony on this item? No one signed up for this item. Very good. I, you're getting off easy then today. Thank Please you, Mayor. Call the roll. Hardesty. Aye. Udaley. Aye. Fritz. Thank you for your very succinct presentation. Aye. Wheeler. That was a short one and the technology worked as well. I vote aye, the ordinance is adopted. Thank you. Next item, 699. Amend Joint Office of Homeless Services Intergovernmental Agreement with Multnomah County to authorize fiscal year 2020-21 budget allocation to the Joint Office of Homeless Services and extend to June 2022. Colleagues, I'd like to make an amendment. I'd like to remove the extension through June 2022 in the IGA for the Joint Office to I make second. this to make this change. <laughs> Go ahead, Mayor. <laughs> Commissioner Hardesty and I did not practice this in advance. <laughs> to make this change, I move to amend the title of the ordinance to strike the reference to the extension through June 2022, amend paragraph three of the findings in the ordinance to strike the reference to the extension through June 2022, amend paragraph five on page three of the exhibit A to strike June 30th, 2022, and replace it with June 30th, 2021, and to make any other conforming changes in the exhibits necessary to remove the extension through June 2022. Commissioner Hardesty has seconded this. Any further discussion on the amendment? Call the roll. Hardesty? Aye. You daily? Aye. Fritz? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. The amendment passes. And with that, uh, we are here to hear, I believe, from Mark Jolin and Shannon Callahan. I'm guessing my notes don't say that that's who I would pick if I had to pick two people to talk about this. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Shannon Callahan uh, from the Portland Housing Bureau. Um, as you all know, uh, the city of Portland has a strong partnership with Multnomah County through our Joint Office of Homeless Services. Um, this partnership was initially uh, formed in uh, 2016. And this um, annual IGA amendment facilitates uh, the council approved annual budget allocation to the joint office. Um, this year, uh, the um, IGA also contains additional federal funding related to the COVID emergency um, to help um, people who are uh, living on our streets, in our shelters, and in other um, in other uh, means uh, unhoused. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark for a few brief comments and thank you for your time. Colleagues, any questions for uh, Director Callahan? Mark, you, you, you wanna jump in on this? Only to, to say thank you and to make myself available for any questions you may have about this amendment. 
Good. Any questions? I'm not seeing any particular at this moment. Uh, Carla, do we have any public testimony on this item? Uh, we had two people signed up. I believe one is definitely there. Uh, Adam yeah. Brown. Adam, you with us? Is that who I saw? There he Good is. Morning. Good morning, folks. That, that's that's probably a mistake. I'm the business services manager for the joint office, and I'm here to support uh, this item as needed. Very good. Thank you, Adam. Any uh, other about, sorry, Richard Rubin, I'm not seeing him. Keelan, do you do we have him? Um, I believe he canceled his request. OK, thank you. Very good. Any further discussions going once, going twice, gone, call the roll. Hardesty. Aye. You daily. Aye. Fritz. Thank you for all of your work. It's much appreciated. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. Um, and uh, as a slight footnote to my vote, uh, since the ordinance is now adopted, uh, Mark, I want to thank you in particular for your hard work and your forbearance. Obviously, uh, you and I are in discussions about how to retool our efforts around reducing street homelessness and connecting people to the services that they need to be connected to. Uh, you have been very uh, nimble in terms of expanding shelter capacity on behalf of both the city of Portland and Multnomah County during the COVID crisis to comply with the CDC guidelines. Uh, but I think all of us understand here uh, and acknowledge that the community wants us to do much more in order to reduce the number of people that are camping in our streets, in our doorways, in our overpasses, and elsewhere. People are increasingly concerned about the victimization of people on our streets. There's clearly a demand for and a need for additional shelter space and potentially sponsored camping spaces that are safe that have proper hygiene and running water and trash collection services and connections to services and support. And I want the community to know I hear that concern. I share that concern and it will be my intention going forward to address those concerns. And we would love to have the full throated and energize support of our colleagues uh, at Home for Everyone and in the Joint Office of Homeless Services. But absent that, the City Council will have our own discussions about the $37 million currently allocated towards those efforts. And we will always ask and have a duty to always ask whether or not those funds are going towards the issues that we believe are the most important. And right now, from my perspective, it is street homelessness and it is addressing the chronically homeless on our streets and doing everything we can to resolve their situations and help get them off the streets and keep them off the streets. So that will be my focus. I believe my colleagues uh, share that concern. Mark, you've heard it, you've worked with us. Uh, we hope you'll continue to do so. Um, but um, that is the spirit in which I am endorsing and voting for this ordinance. And as I said, the ordinance is adopted as amended. Thank you both. Next up, 700. Approve application under the multiple unit limited tax exemption program under the inclusionary housing program for Sullivan's Ridge Building A located at 1722 Northeast Multnomah Street. So it's not a month or a Wednesday morning meeting for the Portland City Council without a guest appearance by Dory Van Brockle. And she is here. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor, and or I guess good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, I'm is. going to look at sharing my screen and I'd actually like to present on this item and the following item together. So give me a moment here. Excuse me, Mayor, do we need Carla to read? The second item. Good call. Carla, could you uh, thank you, Commissioner Hardesty, for reminding me of that. Um, but no, we're going to read these separately. I've been advised we need to read them separately. Is she is. Oh, uh, never mind. I stand corrected. Uh, read them together. 701 as well, please. Mm -hmm. 701 approve application under the multiple unit limited tax exemption program under the inclusionary housing program for Sullivan's Ridge Building D located at 1812 Northeast Multnomah Street. Awesome, thank you. Sorry for the confusion, Dory, go ahead. 
Well, hello, um, Mayor and uh, Commissioners. Again, I'm Dory Van Bockel with the Portland Housing Bureau. And uh, we're here to talk about two different projects uh, that are subject to inclusionary housing, um, where buildings with 20 or new residential units have uh, five different options to choose from in order to provide affordable housing on site of their development or by sending it to another site. And they're also able to reconfigure those um, different units into particular sizes or for to have uh, more family size units, or they can pay a fee in lieu of providing the affordability. Um, so the, the two projects we're talking about, again, are part of a larger development of six total buildings. Uh, these two buildings, building A and building D, are actually um, going to be taking um, advantage of consolidating their units into these two buildings for the whole site. So of those six buildings, the affordable units will be provided in these two, which will also still have some um, market rate units within them as well. So the two ordinances today are to provide a tax exemption for those affordable units within these two buildings only. More specifically about what we are looking at for the projects, um, this uh, building A is a 24 unit apartment building. It's been converted from a current motel. And within it, it, it is mostly studio units, but also has a few one bedroom, two bedroom units, a little bit larger than what we normally see. You can see the, the average square footage. Um, any of the inclusionary housing units within the building have to be at least 90% of the average square footage across the building. And uh, the minimum option that the building is subject to based on what was chosen by the developer is 15% of the units at 80% of median family income. By consolidating some of the responsibility from other buildings, there will be 33% of the units in building A um, restricted over the 99 year time frame. So that is a total of eight units altogether, six studio and two, um, two bedroom units. Looking at the tax benefit, as well as then the rest rent discount on average, you know, these are based on projected rents and projected value of the, of the property that then results in what um, the exemption value will be. So the tax exemption itself is only applicable for the first 10 years that the building's in service. However, again, the restriction is for 99 years. So in this case, on an annual basis, uh, we can estimate, oh, excuse me, that, um, you know, the total tax exemption is $336 per year, and the average rent, rent desk discount based on current market rates would be 2310 or on a monthly value, uh, a savings of $193 per unit a month compared to $4 a month that would be expended in tax exemption. Similarly, the building D um, also is a 24 unit building and but will be receiving a few more units from the rest of the, the projects on site, resulting in 67% of the building being affordable at 80% of median family income and that comes out to 12 studios and four two bedroom units. Because these buildings are pretty much um, one in the same, um, it actually has the same estimates and projected uh, savings from both the tax exemption um, compared to the market rent differential between the affordable rents. Are there any questions? Colleagues, any questions? Dory, thank you. Um, as, as always, it was, those were great presentations. Carla, is there any public testimony on either of these items, 700 or 701? No one signed up for these items, Mayor. Very good. Please call the roll on item 700. Hardesty? Aye. You daily. Thank you, Dory. I vote aye. Fritz? Thank you, Dory. I actually like this program. I think it's a, a, a good benefit to have the long-term affordability in return for the short-term, fairly um, modest um, tax exemption. 
So I vote aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted 701. Call the roll. Hardesty. Aye. You daily. Aye. Fritz. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Item 702, please. Vacate South Broadway <laughs> Drive at Southwest Grant Street, subject to certain conditions and reservations. Commissioner you daily. Thank you, Mayor. This street vacation is connected with the efforts to save and relocate the historic Morris Marks House. And I'm going to turn it over to PBOT's Carl Arruda to present the item. I hope. Just trying to unmute here. Thank you. Hi, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> Good uh, afternoon, uh, Mr. Mayor and Commissioners. Um, I'm Carl Arruda, I'm a right-of-way agent uh, with the Bureau of Transportation. Um, and as Commissioner Udaly uh, said, this street vacation ordinance um, is uh, connected with uh, the efforts to preserve the uh, historic Morris Marks House. Uh, the street vacation is for uh, vacating a piece of unused right-of-way at the intersection of uh, Southwest Grant Street and Southwest Broadway Drive. And I think Keelan has a, uh, some slides uh, that I had prepared. Thank you, Keelan. So you can go to the, the next one, thanks. And uh, so on this uh, first map, uh, the arrow is pointing to the uh, area of the street vacation. Um, uh, you'll see uh, I-405 and Broadway and Sixth Avenue in the vicinity. Um, and you can go to the next one, Keelan. Um, and so this slide has a closer up view of the proposed vacation area. And so there's a triangular parcel there at the intersection of Broadway and Grant and Broadway Drive. And on the ground, that parcel looks like one piece of land, one parcel of land. The, uh, the left side of the triangle is officially um, public right of way. And so that is where the uh, vacation area is proposed. Um, the east side of the triangle uh, was previously owned by the city. Um, the the right-of-way piece of it uh, was originally dedicated to the public back in 1867 and uh, was part of what is now Broadway Drive. And Keelan can go to the next slide, I think. And so this photo is from several years ago, maybe actually 2015 or 2016, um, shows what the triangular lot looked like um, uh, back then from Grant Street, uh, looking towards downtown. And we can go to the next slide. And so, and as uh, Commissioner Udaly mentioned, um, this project is in, in connection with uh, the Morris Marks House, and so that's part of the original purpose of um, what's going on here. And uh, so the goal was to help preserve the Morris Marks House, which is shown here in its original location on Southwest 12th Avenue um, in downtown. Um, the house was originally built in 1880 and is one of a very few examples in Portland of Italianate architecture uh, in Portland. Uh, the house, back in 2015 or so was uh, scheduled or in danger of demolition uh, when a group of people, um, including the applicants, uh, Karen Carlson and Rick Michelson, arranged to buy the house from the previous owner on the condition that they move it. Um, and so in conjunction, uh, the city's contribution was to agree to sponsor the street vacation and to sell to the applicants uh, the neighboring piece of land um, for the uh, house to be moved. Um, the surplus sale for that piece of land was authorized by council back in uh, 2017, and that sale closed in 2018 um, to facilitate uh, the house being moved. And so, Keelan, you go to the next slide. Thank you. And so this is the house um, after it was moved um, to the uh, triangular parcel. Um, so this view is from uh, Broadway, uh, looking south, southeast. And so the street vacation 
um, is part of the applicant's plan to use the vacation area as a uh, parking lot for the house and the house um, will be used um, as commercial office space. And uh, next slide, Keelan. Thank you. Um, and so this slide shows a couple of views of the house and the vacation area um, uh, during the uh, renovations from a few months ago. Um, and one more slide, Keelan. Uh, thanks. And this uh, shows a few more views from uh, last week, I think it was a week or two ago, uh, with the fencing removed. And you can see the gravel area is uh, roughly the street vacation area um, next to the house. Um, we're looking downtown again from Grant Street. Uh, the one condition, one major condition um, that we received during the comment period was from the Water Bureau. Uh, the Water Bureau has two um, significant lines running underneath uh, the vacation area and a fire hydrant, uh, which you can see in one of those photos. And so the Water Bureau required uh, a permanent easement um, to protect those lines and, and the Bureau's access um, to them and to the fire hydrant. Um, and on the next slide, Keelan. Um, so this is an aerial view um, from before the house was moved, but this shows the, uh, the water lines and the hydrant um, uh, in their relation to the vacation area. And you can see the close-up of the hydrant next to the house um, that will stay in place. And uh, next slide, Keelan. Um, and so this shows um, a schematic of a preliminary uh, parking plan of what the parking lot uh, would look like uh, next to the house um, if the street vacation is approved and uh, the parking lot is uh, constructed um, in that gravel area that you saw previously. Uh, so besides the Water Bureau's condition for their easement, um, the other notable request during the comment period was from a couple of different people um, to make sure that there was adequate pedestrian access, especially on uh, Broadway, up on the uh, upper right corner of the uh, slide. <clears throat> and so during the surplus process um, and during the street vacation process, PBOT staff made sure um, that we retained enough uh, right of way along Broadway um, for future expansion of the pedestrian and bicycle corridor that could be part of the um, uh, Green Loop project. And um, I believe that's all I have for now. Um, I'll be happy to take any questions. Um, and I think Karen and Rick may have some comments. All right, comments. Thank, thank you for the presentation. And, and um, uh, anybody have any further questions on that particular item or Commissioner Daly, anything else to add? Uh, I, I just wanna say how much I appreciate the community-wide efforts that went into restoring that facility. And I, I'm just, uh, this is great. This is really great. Thank you for doing it. Uh, do we have any public testimony, Carly? Oh, I, I think we as applicants would like to make a statement or two. Okay, uh, Rick, why don't, why don't you go ahead? And if, if there are uh, others who would like to do that, uh, legal counsel, is there a format I'm supposed to be following for this? Um, no, there isn't, Mayor. Okay, so this isn't that formal, but um, for the applicants, it seems very reasonable to let them testify. So I see Rick and I see Karen. Uh, who else Who else would like to testify? Carla, how many folks do we have? Yeah, Edith Gillis wanted to testify on this. Edith? Okay, why, why don't we, uh, Rick, why don't we go ahead and start with you? Do you think you can do it in three minutes or less? I think I can do it in a minute and a half. Perfect, um, all right, why don't you go ahead? Mayor Wheeler and council members, we're very, very pleased to be here today. And Rick, uh, I'm sorry you have to announce your name for the record. Uh, Rick Michelson, uh, complicated. one of the applicants. We're very pleased to be here today. Uh, we've been working on this project since 2016 and actually moved the house in 2017, three full years ago. Um, we're pleased to say that this is the next to last city approval we need to get this project completed. As soon as we get the street vacation approved, we're going to be getting the building permit um, for the parking lot, which will then complete our obligations. We're very pleased to be part of the green loop system. You see we did some significant improvements on that side of the house. And we look forward to completing this project and when COVID is over, inviting you all to take a tour. 
in the meantime, there are a lot of pictures online um, that you can take a look at. It's looking spectacular, and we're really, really pleased with the project and with the city's support on this. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Commissioner Fritz has a comment or a question. Uh, thank you very much. And um, you, you noted that you've been involved since 2016. I think it was in 2006 when David, uh, Dr. David Cutler and his wife Nancy um, first informed me about this house and the efforts to save it. Um, Dr. Cutler and his wife were two of the first people to be really kind to me and my husband when we arrived here in 1986. So this has been a really long project. Um, I did notice the um, article in the Oregonian last week saying that the property is for sale for 1.8 million and that the city sold the land for a dollar. So, Rick, would you like to tell folks, you know, about the, the costs of moving, restoring, so that that gets put into context? Sure. Um, our total cost on this project is going to be about $2.3 million. Um, we think 1.8 million is a reasonable sales price, and I consider the $500,000 or so a contribution we're making is a contribution, a thank you to the city of Portland for, for all the years I've made my living doing this work. Uh, we never went into this to make a profit, um, and we're happy with the result and, and where this has turned out. Thank you. I appreciate you putting that onto the record. And also, while well, I'm, I'm commenting while you're here, and thank you, Karen, for being here also. Um, many, many people worked really hard on this. Rachel Wiggins in um, Mayor Hales's office. Commit we thought we were in charge of it when I was in charge of parks, and several of my staff worked on it. And then it turned out the Water Bureau was, so Commissioner Fish took over. Um, and so it, it has. It was very, very complicated, and I appreciate all of the effort. And whenever I used to go by on the bus on my way to work or on my way home, I would always look over and, and marvel at how beautiful it looks now. What, what a gateway to the central city it's, it's going to be. So I look forward to being able to come and visit it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Commissioner. Carla, who's next? Was that Karen um, Carlson? Yeah, say something? yeah, yeah I see Karen. Go ahead, Karen. Hi, I'm Karen Carlson. And like Rick, I'm really pleased to be here. This has um, been a long, long process. Um, uh, and I think actually every single city employee has been involved in this process, or at least it feels like they have. Um, we've gone through many, many different approvals through just about every bureau I can think of. And it's marvelous um, and beautiful and, um, and 140 years old. So I think it looks darn good for 140 years old. And um, just to clarify things, Commissioner Fritz, we paid $180,000 for the land. We paid a dollar for the house. And as I think, uh, it's about a half a million to move it. It was pretty expensive altogether. So, um, but we are pleased to have done it. We think it's beautiful. We want to show it off. We're sad that it's COVID and we can't show it off except with photographs. Um, but I'm happy to share photographs for anyone who would like to have them. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Karen, appreciate it. Commissioner Udaley, do you have your hand raised? Yes, you do, thank you. I do. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just wanna uh, quickly appreciate Rick and uh, his company for their commitment to historic preservation. I'd love to see the photos. It's so hard to look at uh, vintage photos from Portland and realize all the incredible buildings that we've lost over the decades. So. Um, it would be great to see photos of ones that we still have and that have been lovingly and beautifully restored. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, and uh, Carla, does that complete public testimony on this item? No, we have Edith Gillis. Oh yeah, sorry, Edith, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I want to really appreciate the integration and cooperation that's been involved with this, um, the multiple layers. Um, I also want to encourage you to require um, that there be permeable surface to maximize the stormwater um, bio um, filtration. I'd like you to maximize the photosynthesis of carbon sequestration, um, keep those trees, increase the trees, uh, cleaning and cooling our air. And um, 
and making it easy and economical with accessibility to the utilities um, instead of having that um, a hard pavement and also um, inviting a, a rest space because that's a, a very difficult, very difficult place with all the um, pavement to get to a safe space if one is walking, bicycling, um, or uh, suddenly has a car accident and is stranded. So if you can encourage more um, pollinator path trees and, and plantings and, and letting the parking space be pesticide free, but letting the storm water to percolate down. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. It's beautiful. Thank you, Edith. And Carla, that completes public testimony. Is that correct? That's correct, Mayor. All right. Uh, any further comments, Commissioner Daly? Mayor, I just need to read a statement uh, before we move on. I want to quickly announce that a transportation item that should have been heard at today's council meeting will be heard next week, September 16th. The item would authorize the Bureau of Transportation to acquire certain permanent and temporary rights necessary for construction of the outer Northeast Halsey 114th to 162nd project through the exercise of the city's eminent domain authority. So we will hear that next week. Very good. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, with that, Carla, this is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. And now we'll go back to the items that were withdrawn from the consent agenda. 688 is our first item. 688, amend business license code sorry, related to the administration of the residential rental registration program and housekeeping changes. Colleagues, in July of 2018, the Portland City Council passed Ordinance 189086, which created the Residential Rental Registration Program. It required all owners of residential units in the city to register those units with the Revenue Division. In August of 2019, the City Council passed Ordinance 189650, enacting a per unit registration fee beginning in tax year 2019 as part of the Residential Rental Registration Program. This ordinance amends the business license law code to provide additional clarity in the rental, the registration, the residential rental registration program and improve administration of the registration fee. It adds a definition of residential rental unit to the code and it specifies that the residential rental registration fee is subject to late payment and late filing penalties and interest very similar to the business license tax. The ordinance also removes from the city business income tax return, the donation to the arts impact fund, formerly known as work for art, which is administered by the regional arts and culture council, otherwise known as RAC. A review of past participation determined that including the donation as a refund offset was not cost effective. Going forward, the revenue division will prominently provide RAC donation information on the tax form. Uh, I don't know if we have somebody else here to testify on this, and I'm not sure who pulled it, Carla. Edith Gillis pulled these. Very good. And I don't know if we have somebody from staff here to... Uh, uh, Scott Rader has, is here. Um, so why, why don't we listen to Edith's testimony, and then if Scott wants to respond to it, that's great. I see Scott Carter's on the line. Um, I'm having a little problem with this traumatic brain injury, um, and I suddenly forgot which item I'm looking at. Uh, Edith, this is, this is item 688. It amends the business license law code related to the administration of residential. Thank um, you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I really want to thank you for specifying that it's a residential rental unit versus rental property. I want to thank you for requiring um, the all owners of residential um, rental units to register and to provide schedule. And um, and I really like that you're you're having the timing of it very specific and ongoing. I'm not sure about the fining um, and consequences, but I'm going to trust the incredible work of Commissioner Daly. Um, I have some questions about joint ventures. I imagine everything people do is a way of sharing combined resources, talents, and skills with one another. Um, 
And I'm not quite sure why uh, joint ventures was crossed out in all this. And um, uh, after my comments, I'd love to be able to hear that. And I also want to um, kind of alert you that there are some people who are being very suspicious that um, candidates are um, maybe excluding different things and we don't know, or there's some really fantastic ideas that we don't understand why they're fantastic and we could you know, better support and encourage it. Um, I want to also say uh, regarding C, um, what are some examples of joint ventures when it comes to landlord-tenant law and, and parentheses, including tenants in common agreements? Why are they stricken? Um, what are some other examples? And, and then I also want to really appreciate the excellent work in cleaning up the confusion regarding the arts impact fund. Um, as an artist, um, as a taxpayer, I get sometimes confused about this stuff. I also want to publicly thank and commend um, the tax dollar stewardship, the, um, the care, the advocacy, the justice, the work, the courage of Commissioner Udaly in, um, in really standing up for good landlords and tenants. Um, so if, at the end of this, if you would explain a little bit more about uh, why you, you, you kicked out um, a joint venture, I will yield the rest of my time. Thank you again. Thanks, Edith. Scott, do you have an answer for that question? I'm actually going to defer to Matt Thorup, who's also uh, in the meeting. All right, thanks. Hi, uh, this is Matt Thorup from the Revenue Division. Um, with the joint venture, this is more of cleaning up the business license law, less in relation to the residential rental. There is no tax filing for a joint venture, so they still would be subject to them. It just cleans up our filing and the treatment of them will be handled through administrative rules and business tax policies. Okay, thank you. Um, did anybody else, Commissioner Daly, you have your hand up, but I think that may be left over. Anybody else have any further questions? All right, this is the first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. The next item was 690. Amend local improvement district procedure for technical clarifications. Andrew, this sounds like something right up your alley. Andrew Abbey, welcome. Thank you, Mayor Whaler. Andrew Abbey, local improvement district administrator. This is really just the housekeeping uh, ordinance, uh, housekeeping ordinance to um, make code more readable and to make some technical correction. I uh, believe that Edith Gillis pulled the item and wants to testify on it. I'll be happy to answer any questions that council may have. All right, good. We'll hear from Edith and then if there's a response, uh, you can respond. Uh, Carla, why don't you go ahead and call the testimony? I believe it's just Edith. It is, Edith Gillis. Thank you, I have a question about page one, two A. It says a property tax exemption is not grounds from exempting a, a property from an LID assessment. Could you please explain more? Uh, Mayor Wheeler, uh, responding to Edith's question, um, we wanted to be uh, clear in LID code. We're increasingly doing LIDs with uh, partners who are not subject to property taxation. For example, right now we have a very large uh, LID going with TriMet in the Coley neighborhood of Northeast Portland. Um, so we included that language for clarity that just because a property may not be subject to property taxes, uh, that that doesn't automatically exempt a property from an LID assessment to the extent that there's a council makes a finding of special benefit for that property. Very good, thank you. Colleagues, any further questions on this item? This is a non-emergency ordinance as well. So this is the first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. We'll move to second reading. And Carla, am I correct? We've now completed this morning's agenda. That's correct, Mayor, yes. All right, very good. We'll see you all back here at two o'clock. We are adjourned, thank you.